Good evening. I'd like to call to order the uh, South Pearl School Committee open meeting for Wednesday, June 8th, 2022 at 6.30 p.m. In attendance, uh, um, in addition to myself, are Ms. O'Mealy, Ms. Primick, uh, Ms. Tolander. Um, so we have a quorum, and uh, we will move on to the first order of business, which will be the recognition of retirees. Sure, so it's um, with great pleasure this evening that I get to recognize four of our long-standing employees who have made the decision to retire. Um, I did employ our best person to try to convince them otherwise, and that was uh, <laughs> Keith Lavoie. So, so no one but had he, failed? Is that what you're saying? He, miserably. he failed miserably. Uh, so this evening, I, again, I would like to recognize our, our four retirees. So we have seven retirees in South, South Pro this year. And between the seven retirees, they have over 138 years of experience. So um, although we are excited for their next chapter in their career, we also recognize that as, as a loss of expertise um, and commitment and dedication um, of the four employees that I'll acknowledge this evening. So we're, we're happy for you. Too bad we can convince you otherwise. Um, but. I think I would retire too if I could. <laughs> um, so we have Nancy Bowman who um, is retiring um, after many years serving as a kindergarten teacher at Finn School. Prior to um, joining Finn in 1989, she served as a kindergarten teacher in Holliston. Um, and Clayton hired her in 1980. No, that no, wasn't Clayton, right? No. <laughs> so, and I, I did look at your first year salary. You were half time at the time. Yeah, so, you made $10,790 <laughs> back in the day. Um, and you were hired by Assistant Superintendent uh, Robert E. Mellican and Superintendent Dennis DeSalvo. And I just want to thank you for your commitment to the kids and students at Finn School. You have been outstanding. Um, you've been so dedicated to the profession and the families and the students. And you will leave behind um, a legacy. And the work that you've done will endure in, in the lives of our students. So thank you. Thank you. So. Thank you very and, much. And um, you have five minutes for a speech. Oh, I do. No, no. <laughs> I didn't prepare. <laughs> I'm honored. Just, Thank you. No, I promise. I was um, acknowledging the fact that it was probably pretty, it's not the best retirement acknowledgement to invite our retirees to a school committee meeting. There's probably a, I'll have, to, I'll have to think about the best way to honor our retirees in the future. But thank you for, for coming this evening. So next we have um, Kim Bowker who um, is the Trottier nurse. Um, and before coming to um, our district in South Grove, she served as at Mass General Hospital as a adolescent uh, in adolescent pediatrics. Um, and prior to that, I didn't know this, you were a float nurse in North Grove. Um, all over. So she floated across our three districts. <laughs> um, and I think that the past two years have been extraordinary. So. Um, I just want to thank you for all the time prior to the pandemic that you've uh, provided to our students. Um, you've been such an integral part of the Trottier community, um, volunteering on the Washington trips and being part of committee work and just being a key part of the culture at, at Trottier. Um, so I wish you well um, in your, your encore career, whatever that might be, <laughs> um, and you leave behind big shoes to fill so so thank you for your hard work and dedication i'm not sure if gary or keith have any words you would like to add i would like to hope that she'll be a sub nurse <laughs> <laughs> that's part of the retirement agreement isn't it i thought so yes no but you know kim has uh served trottier so well over the years and i thought of her often during the pandemic but then i went back to our washington trips and i said i don't know what was worse uh, all the things that she had to do uh, while taking 158th graders to DC, but you know how much you're going to be missed and certainly loved. And um, you know, I know this day is—it's uh, been tough for me to even think about it because of all the time we've had together. But I wish you the best, Kim. And you still can go on the Washington and trip. Yeah, and no, it's still a possibility. So. All right, next. 
we have Barbara Johnson, um, so who has served as the ELL teacher in Southboro for a number of years. And I learned a little bit about um, your, your career prior to coming to Southboro. So you served as a grade five and six teacher at the St. Peter's School in New York and Framingham, Framingham Public Schools, grade one and two combined bilingual Spanish teacher, um, and the Christi, uh, Krista McAuliffe Regional um, Charter School, and also Wellesley Public Schools as a year as an ESL tutor. Um, and then you joined Trottier and Neary. Neary, actually they- You joined no Neary. Students, believe it or not, no students. No students. No so no at Neary, you no started ESL. at- Neary and Finn. So Neary and Finn, um, and then you are ending your career at Finn School as an ELD teacher, and you've done amazing work, and I know that um, you leave behind great big shoes to fill, and I think Rhoda has shed a few tears, Clayton. Many tears. And, Cl and Clayton has shed a lot of tears, so we thank you for your commitment and dedication to the district and the students, and we wish you well in your return. And lastly, we have Amy Riley, who is um, leaving Trottier School um, as a science teacher. And what I didn't realize was that Amy um, did her practicing teaching at Neary School um, and joined Trottier, um, her, I think after your, your practicum, the next year you were hired as a math and social studies teacher. Mm -hmm. Um, and served as sixth grade math and social studies, and then you gained your license in science, and you've been a science year, a science teacher at Trottier for for many years. And your passion and dedication to the Trottier students has been evident. You've been part of clubs and homework clubs, and um, the climate and culture at Trottier, and um, you'll be sorely missed. Um, and we wish you well in your encore career, whatever that might be. You can come back and sub too. So. <laughs> and Mr. Hershock, I'm not sure if you have any words of. Yeah. Amy possesses everything you want in a teacher, uh, a passion for the content, uh, tremendous pedagogy, and a, you know, uh, a supportive personality. Um, the greatest compliment I could say is I'd want my own my own children to have you as a teacher. You probably don't want to have my children as, uh, in your classroom. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, honestly, you, you know, if you've ever seen Amy's classroom, it's calm, it's collected, it's organized, um, and the energy and um, the culture she's always built has been tremendous over the years. So thank you, Amy, for those years of service. Thank you, Karen. And thank you all for the opportunity. It's been wonderful. And you can always unretire. I think that is possible, a possibility. So. I thought that letter said I couldn't. <laughs> I, I crossed that off. So. Um, but again, thank you. I'm not sure if I turned over back to the chair for any words. Well, we, can, we can fix those letters. Okay. <laughs> yeah, there's something like that that uh, needs to be changed. I still have it. <laughs> well, it's great to, it's, it's, it's um, you know, it's, it's always sad to have, you know, Good teachers retire. Um, I guess uh, hopefully it will uh, be a happy transition for all of you. And uh, um, you know, you are part of, have been part of our most important resource. You know, as far as our kids, you know, in our district. Um, so thank you. Um, yeah, I'll just um, echo what um, Greg said, which is like you know, congratulations and. Um, Good luck in your encore decisions, whatever those are, you know. And um, you earned this, so congratulations to you. Thank you for your service. And, um, you know, I feel like that you're as teachers, as educators, as role monitors, you know, um, what, you know, I'm sure you've done so many like support groups um, where you've been in after school programs, et cetera. Um, we really appreciate it, so thank you. Are we going to go down the road? <laughs> we all think so. No, but I mean, you're just, you're the heart and soul of what happens. And, you know, we just kind of zoom in here once a month or whatever and do these little things. But, you know, I, there are so many things we know that, that you all do that we don't even see. And that's what really makes 
everything so successful and um, could not be more appreciative. So thank you and good luck with whatever comes next. Ditto, everything down the row. But um, yeah, thank you so much for your service. Um, the best is probably yet to come, so good luck. And um, don't forget us. <laughs> Uh, I just so echoing what everyone else says, thank you to all of you and best of luck. I'm sad that my daughter never had the opportunity to see, to be with some of you uh, because you're leaving before she gets to Trotty. Or, uh, um, but good luck to all of you. And just to add one thing, as I'm um, thinking about our teachers as a group, um, we are, um, I think as a, as a, as a town, um, I think as, can't speak for the district, but I'll go ahead and say as a district and as a school committee, you know, we are, I think, blessed to have a great relationship with the teachers. And as I've gone through, you know, watching the news, okay, over the last couple of years and uh, um, watched so many situations where that's not the same, um, we're really thankful to, um, you know, to have the teachers that we do. So uh, thank you again. If it's the will of the chair, I'd like to recommend taking a 10-minute uh, recess because we do have cake. And this is the first cake that we've had in many years. So, um, you, break. you must have found out that I never refuse cake. <laughs> okay, any place. Right. We could be an unpopular chair and <laughs> not right. make the recommendation. Cake. I think uh, let's, let's, ooh, let's have cake. Yes. Right. Thank, Thank you. So we are uh, we are in recess, and we'll. Uh
All right, we are back from recess and we are continuing the uh, South Coast School Committee meeting. So, next up is public comments. I don't see much of the public. No, no offense, Dave. But, um, <laughs> so, next up is new business updates and principles. So, we'll start with uh, Principal Ryan with an update. Thank you, Greg. Um, I'd like to start by thanking the FinSOS for our wonderful uh, Staff Appreciation Week. The generosity from all parents and especially me of Benoit was um, incredible. We're, as uh, Roger was talking earlier, you know, we do have a great relationship with our community educators to, to parents and the community. And we are all very fortunate to work in such a supportive community like South Grove. The, the rallying around us and making us all feel special was uh, incredible. I'd also like to recognize and congratulate Kathy Wilson. Kathy Wilson is our school psychologist at Finn. She recently received the South Bureau Youth and Family Services fourth annual Lori Sugarman Whittier Wellness Award. It's a mouthful, which you well deserve. The award is given out to individuals who have promoted um, to make South Bureau a better place for all. Kathy is a strong advocate for children's mental health, and she's committed to making sure every child at the Finn schools feels safe and connected. I'd also like to recognize Jennifer Henry, um, Finn Schools Preschool Administrator, she'll be presenting in a little bit, for her organization of the first annual Early Childhood Fair this past Saturday. Um, from what I heard, there was quite a showing. I was unable to attend. <coughs> Jennifer said about 50 families showed up and there were about 10 community sponsors. Uh, the months of May and June are very important months at the Mary Finn School. Uh, for many of our students, it's their first time that they need to bring closure to relationships. Um, and what that means is they've established relationships early on with us, connections, and now it's time to bring an end to those and to move on to new uh, environments or new relationships, and especially for our first graders. The transition to a new unknown school where they're expected to make new connections uh, within an unfamiliar environment. We do a lot of preparation with our kids in the month of May, slowly exposing them to what the end will bring, the feelings associated with it, and that it's okay. Um, th to this point, we have a lot of activities taking place within this month of June. Uh, last week we had our Finn School Field Day. Lots of existing preschool records were broken in the discus, <laughs> javelin, and the, uh, the mile. Uh, Friday, June 10th is our K in Grade 1 Field Day. We're so excited to have lots of parent volunteers. On June 14th and 15th, we have, and 16th, we have our preschool graduation ceremonies, and invitations were sent out by classroom teachers. And on the 14th and 15th, kindergarten is having a farewell to kindergarten celebration. Also on the 16th is Finn's first grade farewell. It's a bigger um, celebration, um, an afternoon of fun and outdoor excitement. Um, a lot of our first graders are a little apprehensive about what the Woodward School brings. So we're scheduling step up day for June 21st, where our first graders will be visiting, touring, and meeting staff at the Woodward School. Some other events happening at Finn. Uh, today we had Kim Evers, South Rose librarian. Uh, she was talking to our students about the South Rose Library and how students can get their library card. Um, in academics, some updates in kindergarten. Uh, Jen's going to speak about preschool, um, kindergarten and grade one. Students are finishing up a unit on persuasive writing, and teachers are conducting their end of the year assessments. In math, students are learning about measurement, weights, and capacity. And students in both K and one are learning about the elements of a story, plot, storyline, character development. Um, and as always, I need to put out a plug for the Finn Family Garden. 
Uh, we do have tomatoes planted, cucumbers, eggplants, green onions, and some other veggies. A sign-up um, notice will be sent out to families from Kristen Peterson, our K-team leader. Uh, we do encourage and um, select parent volunteers to maintain the garden over the summer um, and drop off anything that the garden yields, which hopefully will be a lot of tomatoes and cukes, um, at the food pantry. Um, so that lots of busy things happening with the Finn School. Questions? Mm -hmm. Is there a line? No. Yeah. So, so I have the javelin question, but I'm going to skip it. Oh, you just. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was just a joke. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you. So, I'm going to present for Mr. Mucci has written a novel that I'm going to share. <laughs> <laughs> he is on fire. I think this is a test of my ability to read. And he is on father duties. He is on okay. father duties. So, and I'm on. Um, I'm representative. Mr. 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 When he got, it's three pages, so get ready. <laughs> Lots going on at the Woodward School. Uh, so field day, um, they are looking forward to their field day, which was rescheduled from last Friday. This year, um, they are planning a day of fun outside with a portion of the day being used for team building and individual games and challenges and other um, and other community partnerships. We'll be welcoming, they'll be, so not, he wrote it in the first person, so I've been changing it. <laughs> um, they will be welcoming guests from Harvard University and the Think First Injury Prevention Program. The Southboro Fire Department will also be joining them to discuss summer safety and may even be bringing a vehicle for students to explore. <laughs> they'll be kicking off the summer reading program in partnership with the Southboro P Public Library and they are very excited to be hosting their annual book swap after a two-year hiatus. Eyes on Owls SOS sponsored presentation. Today, they welcomed Marsha and Mark Wilson from Eyes on Owls. This creative arts presentation was sponsored by the SOS. Eyes on Owls introduces students to the owls of New England and beyond. Mark and Marsha shared the field marks, signs, and skills that children can use to find owls in the lab. Through their original photography and published books, they shared unique characteristics of owls, including their diet, habitat, and calls. Students were introduced to six live owls, from small screech owls to the great horned owl. Students love this up-close and interactive introduction to different species of owls. On Monday afternoon, Kathy Lazat joined our pre-K through eight uh, Kathy Lazat, our pre-K through eight mathematics coordinator, along with Brian Coffey, a content developer, introduced staff to STMath. STMath is a pre-K through eight visual instruction program that leverages the brain's innate spatial temporal reasoning ability to solve mathematical problems. Next year, STMath will be used to support and strengthen our students' mathematical thinking and learning through interactive problem solving. Step up day has been scheduled for Tuesday, June 21st. Transition students at Finn Woodward and Neary will visit their new school to tour the space and meet some grade level teachers and specialists. Principal Ryan, Principal Valenti, <coughs> and Mr. Mucci have been collaborating to ensure a smooth transition for students. Last week, our second grade students performed a singing concert for staff and students with the theme of music through our world. Students did a wonderful job performing, sharing the meaning behind the lyrics. This week, third grade string students are performing their end of year recitals. Next week, the entire third grade will be performing their Memorial Day program for staff and students, which was rescheduled from last month. Since these performances are being held during the school day and without community guests, Southboro Access Media has graciously offered to record the concerts will be with, that will be shared out with the entire Woodward community. We are so proud of all of our students, especially and our, and our staff, Joanne Gies, our music strings teacher. We're looking forward to holding in-person concerts and performances next year. Chapter two. <laughs> 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 uh, this, <laughs> this, this month's care theme is compassion, and to help promote and recognize the many ways that students demonstrate compassion, we've created the Woodward Has Compassion display. Every Every time a student is observed demonstrating the care theme of compassion by a staff member or peer, a son is added to the display with their name on it. 
The goal is to brighten up Woodward as much as we can by showing compassion to others. Students stop and look every morning to see the new additions. As of this afternoon, we have over 143 sons representing 143 acts of compassion towards others. And on May 24th, Woodward staff welcomed parents and families of our incoming grade two students to the annual orientation and tour. It was a huge success with over 100 parents and guardians in attendance. I was joined by grade two teachers, Colleen Black and Jen Sear, as well as Carrie Capel, our SLP, Cassie Purcell, our ELD teacher, Jenny Bogart, our behavioral specialist, and Lisa Goulet, one of our special education teachers. We shared all about our school and what students will experience that they become a member of the Woodward community. We ended with questions and answers and a tour of Woodward. The feedback we received has been extremely positive and parents are grateful and excited to be back in our schools. The end. Mm -hmm. does, uh, does anyone have any questions for Steve? <laughs> <laughs> now you're putting me on the spot. <laughs> okay, I'll call him. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Thank you. And it was nice to share. Yeah. <laughs> it was lovely to hear about the compassion board. Yeah. Yes. No, it's true. That it's, yeah. it's true. On to Neary? Yes. Okay. <laughs> uh, first of all, I want to start by thanking the Neary staff members for their commitment this year uh, to putting students in the middle of all our decisions that we make, creating such a welcoming learning environment for students each and every day. I also want to thank RSOS, as Clayton Ryan did, for Teacher Appreciation, Teacher Appreciation Week specifically Jen Brenner, Stephanie Wysocki, and Julia Fialco from breakfast and lunch to gift cards on the Whoopi Pie truck. It was a fantastic week. It was the first time a world language teacher who's from Spain had a Whoopi Pie, and she asked us, well, where do you even get these? <laughs> <laughs> <Any bigger. laughs> uh, so she's a big fan, but it was really nice, and, and they've supported a lot of um, great uh, resources for us throughout the year. So we are grateful to the SOS as well as the parents that support all of our fundraising efforts. Uh, as Principal Lucci mentioned during last week's PLC, our grade level teams were introduced to ST Math by Kathy Lazat and the trainer for ST Math. And we're looking forward to future trainings at the beginning of the year and identifying how to best incorporate this into our math blocks understand, and understanding how to use the data to drive our instruction. In the library, students are presenting research projects which have culminated in a gallery walk for students and staff to view each group's project. In our front hallway, we have a volume zoo where students in the fifth grade have created animals of their choice out of various size boxes, determine their individual and overall volume. And students in fourth grade have been very busy dissecting a cow's eye, a sheep's brain, and their individual squids. Lots of formaldehyde. <laughs> Our bulletin boards are filled with various art projects from clay masks, uh, lumen can flowers, and so much more, and we welcome anyone to come visit. You just have to sign in. Uh, it's been a busy few weeks for us as well. We had our incoming fourth grade parent guardian orientation on the 25th with an amazing turnout. Five of our orchestra ensemble uh, played for performed for the students but also provided tours I mean for the parents also provided tours parents enjoyed being in our school and the students loved showing uh, Neri off to everyone big thank you to Kristen Tev and Jessica Demetra for collaborating on this event with me course concerts uh, it was wonderful to have orchestra band and um, and chorus concerts last week and one this week and even are really special to be able to connect with some of our former students at the chorus concert as they practice our, uh, the Trottier students so we got to see a few of them that was great thanks to Mrs. Bignese and Ms. Sherman they did an exceptional job preparing our students for the performances great turnouts for each one and our whole school got to view the concerts as well and able to celebrate the accomplishments of their peers. We had a Memorial Day Assembly last Friday led by Mr. Wallach and Mrs. Um, Ms. Sherman. Students learned about the history of Memorial Day. Four students played taps and Mr. Wallach and Mrs. Collins students sang the Constitution song uh, from Schoolhouse Rock. You might remember that. Uh, we had our first field day in two years and students engaged in a variety of games and activities. 
and kudos to grade 14 who elongated the day for their students by creating stations such as Imagination Playground, Dash and Dot, and Osmo, um, developing coding skills, and SEL chalk activities, uh, and those are just a few. There are many different activities. And thank you, huge thank you to the parents who volunteered their time. Field trips today was awesome. A Boundless Adventure field trip for our fourth grade friends. And Boundless Adventure, their mission is to empower and inspire students to challenge themselves both mentally and physically. Uh, with challenges comes great confidence and achievement. And the feedback was fantastic from both students and staff. It ties into, the, the program ties into SEL practices and standards. And the teachers were saying the positive self-talk individually but also to peers encouraging them to persevere and and engage in the activities just fantastic uh, fifth grade will embark on their trip next week which includes the freedom trail and state house and all staff and students will participate in a walking field trip to art on the trails uh, next week it, the installation is called grow and take flight uh, they're very large wings um, and a field of flowers, which symbolizes the importance of exposing ourselves to good things in life so we can grow and take flight. That exhibit runs from June 12th to September 11th, and Mrs. Johnson and her artists have worked so hard on this project. We can't wait to see their work. On Flag Day, the fifth grade band will be practicing their marching skills as they parade around the school and through fourth grade recess. And today was our fifth grade volleyball tournament, Finnegan versus Finnegan in the end. Um, and yeah, it was quite intense. Uh, but Finnegan Fruit Loops ended up winning. But everybody celebrated uh, the great sportsmanship, and Mrs. Nash did a terrific job leading that, as well as our field day. We have our fifth grade farewell coming up next Friday. And tomorrow we have 10 former Mary students from Algonquin joining us as part of their day of service. So teachers, they'll be supporting teachers in the classroom and specialists. We had originally assigned them to help us in the courtyard, but I think the rain is going to mm -hmm. alter those plans. But we're excited to have them back. And then as uh, Principal Ryan mentioned, looking forward to um, our, fourth, our fourth grade, third grade friends coming to visit on Step Up Day on the 21st, and I'm looking forward to going to visit Woodward next Tuesday, each of the third grade classrooms, to get to know them and answer some questions. Uh, we're already busy planning for the 22-23 academic year. Teachers have organized a summer book club where we're gonna focus on identifying books for a year-long focus on district themes, cultural diversity, acceptance, and kindness for all. Um, and this will be done during our new uh, Buddy Classroom Times next year. So looking forward to it. Lots of great things. And thanks for listening. Yeah. Any questions? <clears throat> questions for Kathleen? You know, um, just a quick aside, since you mentioned SOS a couple of times, um, you know, I received a very nice um, acknowledgement from SOS. I think all the school committee members did uh, a thank you. And I'll tell you something, uh, now I received a new sports car. I don't know what uh, <laughs> the rest of the committee received. I did have to return it because of the Commonwealth restrictions on the value of gifts accepted. I was, sadly, I had to do that. But um, that was such a nice, you know, it was such a nice gesture, you know, uh, to actually uh, receive that. And uh, so I'd like to say publicly thank you. I'm sure we all may have uh, written notes, but I um, wanted to mention that. Absolutely. Yeah. Next up, All right, Mr. Hershock. Captain, I'm excited. I had some money on the uh, Finnegan Fruit Loop. Oh, <laughs> so good. So we'll deliver tomorrow. I appreciate it. So, um, just in, in regards to some school culture and events that we've had, um, we since we last met, we did host our dance for all three grades. Uh, much to my chagrin, uh, Stairway to Heaven was not played at the end. Um, <laughs> but I think it was a wonderful night. Students had a lot of fun. And I had a student who sincerely asked me, can we do it again next week? So, um, so and she really, really yeah. wanted to have another dance. So, um, <laughs> so uh, that was a great event. Uh, I do want to recognize uh, some music um, concerts and performance, performances. We had a chorus con concert last week. Um, band and orchestra will be playing tomorrow night. Um, next Tuesday, we will have our jazz night, and um, Connor Jenks, who is a Trottier uh, alumni, will come back to join our um, our, uh, our our um, 
our students here, and he's part of a wedding band called Hot Mess, so we're very excited uh, for him to join. But I, I want to share today, we actually invited South Grove senior, uh, the Senior Citizens for um, our big band performance. And if you ever need a uh, pick-me-up, I will invite you back. It was really just a reminder of the impact that our music program has on the community. It was such a wonderful event. Um, Brent Trottier was there. Um, and it was great for him to come back. Um, the seniors kind of mingled afterwards and um, with our performers, and it was just uh, very heartfelt. And it was, uh, it was probably one of the highlights of my year. So um, thank you to Mr. Clark for organizing that. Um, as part of Memorial Day uh, traditions, uh, we did have sixth grader Nathan, Nathan Glazier read the Gettysburg Address uh, during the, um, the ceremonies uh, in Southboro um, uh, over the, the holiday weekend. We also hosted our annual fun run. We had not hosted that in three years, which uh, without SOS support, support, once again, would not have been successful. And, on the um, and we're also hosting a therapy dog event um, on June 14th. Our, uh, we have a leadership group that works with South Pro Youth and Family Services, and they reached out to an organization called People and Pets, and they're gonna be bringing five or six therapy dogs here, so we all can become educated on the benefits of therapy dogs. So if anyone would like to attend, it'll be after school. And on the horizon, we do have our um, end of the year awards and last day ceremonies, our eighth grade banquet on um, June 17th, and a lip sync field day and some trivia involved for students on the second to last day. So very excited about that. Um, in regards to some of our data collection efforts, we just uh, completed the uh, Trottier student survey today. Students had taken that during first period. Um, we'll look at these results over the summer with our leadership team and use this to, to kind of help cultivate some, um, some practices within the school-wide environment within, within, within the classroom. We also um, completed our spring uh, Dibbles um, literacy collection. We're going to be looking at this da data to identify struggling readers in, in, uh, who need support and to build targeted interventions moving forward. Um, in regards to our culturally responsive work, very proud of our GSA presentation to our faculty on May 16th. Um, the students did a wonderful job. They actually they surveyed our faculty in advance and said, what, what would you want to hear from us? Um, our staff um, asked for advice on how to best support the LGBTQ uh, students as a school community, information about different categories of gender and gender identity, advice about creating a safe space in the classroom, and advice about using pronouns and name changes. Uh, I just want to thank um, our guidance counselor, Jessica Anderson, who helped work with the GSA to build this presentation. The students did an amazing job. Um, they gave us, they were informative, they were engaging, they were heartfelt, they showed, shared personal stories and gave us some, some wonderful advice moving forward. Some very simple things, listen to what students are saying to each other and talk to students that are being rude and sensitive. Don't say you're too young to know, you're not too young to be making decisions. Talk about and teach students about gender and sexual orientation and diversity. Wear something that indicates that you are supportive of the LGBTQ plus community, like a rainbow ribbon or bracelet and make safe space and pride our work flags invisible and within your classroom. So these are not, this is low hanging fruit. Um, I think the fact that they walked away and saying we could do more and we could do better. And, um, and I was just immensely proud of the students. Uh, their poise, their presentation, their thoughtfulness was really uh, celebrated by the, uh, our faculty as a whole. Um, I also want to recognize that our World of Difference uh, Peer Leaders uh, Program uh, concluded last week. Um, this has been a huge undertaking um, for the district. We've, we've talked about it throughout the course of the year, so to kind of see the fruits of the labor uh, come forward it was pretty amazing. Our seventh and eighth grade um, you know, students conducted three lessons in our, um, with our sixth grade classes and for all sixth graders to participate in. They talked about implicit bias, responding to acts of discrimination, and promoting inclusive, inclusivity for all students. I want to give a, a huge thank you to Julie Jenks and Pam Lunder who had taken on this, this work, which is, was a huge undertaking, and to all our students. I had an opportunity to, to observe these, um, these sessions, and I couldn't do this as a 7th and 8th grader. I, you know, um, they, the, the topics which they, um, they uh, dove into, the questions they asked, the, their responses, um, their presence was just really um, impressive, and I think the foundation really has been built for, for great su success moving forward. 
Um, next week we are going to Algonquin, I believe with Melican as well, to celebrate you know, um, our first year. No, oh, oh, excuse me, it's this Friday. Sam, it's, it's, 2.30. <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs> Correct, 2.30 this Friday. So we'll be going to Algonquin to celebrate uh, this, this year long endeavor. Um, in addition, as part of our cultural responsive work, our summer reading uh, program is out again. I want to sh uh, thank Mrs. Allenson for collecting uh, a range of novels and um, uh, for, for our community. It also is going to celebrate the theme of windows and mirrors once again. In regards to technology, I want to recognize Jen Devlin, um, who applied for and received two grants from the Southbury Community Fund. Um, one grant was, was for Oculus VR, um, you know, um, yeah, so, uh, yeah. <laughs> and another grant is for drones, so, uh, yeah, so ne next year's theme is we are watching you, so, um, so, uh, so this, is, I think it just, it's just another example of us kind of being creative on how to bring, you know, more technology into school, work on, um, our digital uh, literacy uh, stand, uh, computer science standards and really just try to engage students as, as much as possible. So they'll run through some eighth grade electives. They'll be t uh, taking place in, um, we'll use these in our um, tech ed classrooms. And as she, you know, um, explained this to our faculty that, you know, she's hoping that all departments and classes can kind of tap into these resources. Um, I just do want to have share with some academic highlights with you. Um, our civics action projects through our eighth grade social studies have come to a conclusion and I think um, our students have learned about the process of change. Um, you know, some notable accomplishments. We had a group that focused on clubs and organizations and hopefully through their work we're going to bring um, an after school cooking class, chess club, potentially table tennis and debate team next year. We also had a group that um, has advocated for additional water fountains here at, at Trottier. So uh, currently we have one um, water fill station on the first floor. They feel it's important to bring another one to, uh, to the second floor and hopefully with their work moving forward that they've um, built the foundation so we can support that, that investment. Um, we also had a group that examined sports here at, at Trottier Middle School and with some of their prompting and energy, we may be bringing soccer to uh, Trottier in the fall. Um, that's in the first time in Trottier's history. Um, I'd like to also recognize some of the work in our um, eighth grade ELA, ELA classes. Um, teachers are really focusing on student presentation and research. Um, we've had teachers uh, create TED Talks for our eighth graders and Genius Hour. So this, these, um, these are opportunities for students to present and use technology. But more importantly, students get to choose what they want to present on. And you know, and I think it's so I think it's so important when you give student choice and when they have an opportunity to talk about things that they're passionate about. Um, I saw presentations on why dogs are better than cats, um, <laughs> which I agree. Uh, <laughs> how, to, <sorry. laughs> uh, how to do a proper wheelie on a bicycle. Um, a student talked about dialects and accents and how they developed over time. Fly fishing, how to build a boat, field hockey techniques. In sustainable farming. So, um, so, lastly, I also want to recognize Martha Bachman in our art elective. Um, our students have created a, a, a virtual art elective show, which will be uh, disseminated to the community through the, our uh, weekly OCN. Um, the work is just amazing, um, and really is impressive in, in terms of just the talent that we have here. And uh, I also want to recognize our mural club. If you've walked around the, um, the building, you have historic, well, there's some murals here, and you historically have seen some artwork with some inspirational quotes. This has been a great tradition at Trotter. I think Kathleen, you have a mural coming down to Neary. Um, so as you walk out tonight, if you look in the lobby, the, the completed murals are, are done, and they will find a home for, the, for, ne for next year. So um, it's a, there's about a group, about a dozen students each year uh, take on this, um, this work. So. That's it now for the Trottier front. Any questions? The, the mural, is it an elective? Sorry. It's an after school. Uh, after school. It's after school. <laughs> yes. So. I have a comment. Please. Okay. Um, just on the um, Oculus and Jones yes. um, project. Were you kidding about the title? Or no, I'm kidding about the title. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. so I was just kind of workshopping it here. Right now. <laughs> So, yeah, no, because I'm workshopping it too, and I was like, I was like, what about saying like the future is now? Like, you know, I agree. Or, or like you are the future because it's for the kids. I gotta work on my. Time. <laughs> um, 
they're still stuck in 1980. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then I'll also say too, just some feedback on the dance. I mean, between my own student and just um, her friends, that was such a huge hit. Yeah. Um, they, I think, um, you know, holding it outside and the weather, it was, it was what it was, but they just had such a really, a really great time. And um, I think that there, I don't know if the seventh and eighth graders have not had that experience, right? Right. For the last two years. Yeah. So I'm glad that you thought, you and the team said, let's combine it and yeah. allow them to have that. Um, so question is, do you think going forward, you'll step, you know, segment six, versus seventh and eighth or keep it all together? That, that's a great question, I think, because we hadn't had it. They wanted to open up to everybody. Yeah. And um, I think um, sixth and seventh grade students um, were there in greater attendance that mm -hmm. night. So, because um, I think the eighth graders also have their banquet. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know how we're going to divide, yeah. divide it up. But the goal, I think, would probably be to have like two or three next year. So okay. we'll go cool. from there. Yeah. Um, the weather was perfect for, for yeah. it. So yeah. the, the, the weather was perfect. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. Uh, it's you know the, the the committee that put together all the things that they wanted with lights and smoke machine and everything. <laughs> it was exactly what a, a young person would enjoy. So yeah, the, uh, that's, the playlist. Uh, whoever was the I heard about the playlist. Yeah. That's Mr. Profs. Uh, he is. Yeah. He is. And he is. Uh, <laughs> I mean, Keith knows. He's amazing. Okay. Um, yeah, they, he actually developed this uh, DJ um, business okay. to pay for his sons to do events to <coughs> put them through college. And uh, they're going to be doing the, the SOS banquet, and I mean the 8th grade banquet. And um, yeah, he's amazing and he's very generous with his time as well. Excellent. So, yeah. Anybody else? I have one more. Oh. No. Okay. Uh, so on a more kind of um, serious note, um, and, and it's also a little bit of feedback about the World of Difference program. Sure. Um, you know, the ins there was a recent incident at Trottier, mm -hmm. and um, that you said there were three topics that the group talked about, and yes. the one that was on responding to um, acts of um, prejudice, mm -hmm. and I mean, I think it might say and or violence, um, the, either the um, day after when I started to have a conversation with my student about it, mm -hmm. um, part of her feedback was, Yes, mom. We learned a lot about that from, because she said either the day before or maybe the week before, mm -hmm. the her, the peer leaders came into the classroom, sure. and so they she had the um, the language, the vernacular to actually describe, oh. you know what what was happening and and place what would have been a, the right action or response. So I just thought that this is something that I was always looking for is that there's. What I'm teaching, what we're discussing in the home is also being supported and, and taught at school. So, and to see that she was getting that, I said, oh, you know, well, what did your teacher say? And she said, we didn't even have to focus on what her teacher said. She's like, well, the peer, media, peer group came in and we had these conversations. So I just want to Thank you. acknowledge that. Yeah, I think, um, I think what we're trying to do more is be proactive with these conversations mm -hmm. in this work. You know, I think historically, you know, we've done things reactionary mm -hmm. uh, um, in a reactionary way. And I think, you know, the peer leaders work, the, I talked about the genocide uh, education. Mm -hmm. These are all components that we need to, you know, um, build up in order to, to help, um, you know, combat combat this, you know. And I'm glad that, you know, your daughter's hearing this and mm -hmm. was able to use this. But, and you know, we can always do more. Um, but, and it's starting, and I think it's important that we start in sixth grade. Mm -hmm. And so they get they get that experience, and then they continue throughout the three years here. So. Okay. I, I so I just sort of piggybacking on um, Kamali's question. The did the peer leaders coming into the sixth grade? Did that have was that the timing just coincidental? Coincidental. Yeah, it was, okay. yeah, it was coinc okay. yeah. So I think um, you know we had some growing pains with the you know with. It is a, I will say, I'm really impressed with our 7th and 8th graders. It's a year-long commitment. Yeah. And, you know, and you know from your own, you know, children's schedules, what they, their availability in the fall is not the same in the spring. And so for us to kind of get to that, you know, you know, at one point we were talking about five or six sessions and we were able to only do, do three this year. But the whole, the whole and they do, they do them after school, right? They or, do it, yeah. I mean, a lot of these, oh, um, we would, we did a combination of things. So sometimes we, we would pull them from class, we would meet them during recess, before school, after school. So their commitment is, is um, to get the training is pretty impressive for, for middle school students. Um, so, 
but timing wise, you know, ideally we wouldn't be waiting is till June. So hopefully after, you know, kind of going through this year, you know, and having, you know, some returning members, we can start it up a little bit easier and we can kind of start truncating the, the sessions with our sixth graders. So I guess my, my question is like for the older kids, right? Who are like part of the program, that's great. But like for the kids who are not, like I know like eventually we'll like yeah, yep. get them. But like what Kamali said about like having the like the vocabulary mm -hmm. and like everybody sort of like shared definitions, like I think that is so important, right? We, um, you know, as our leadership team has just, we were having internal conversations saying that, you know, the World of Difference program is just one spoke. You know, the genocide education is another. What more can we do? And, you know, some of the things we've talked about is just having grade level team meetings and just putting it out there. You know, kind of like giving the cliff note version of, of you know, the World of Different philosophy and, you know, the elements that, you know, they're trying to promote and put it out there at the beginning of the year and then let the World of Difference kind of lay, work layer on top of that. Right. Because so. eventually everybody will be. Yeah. We'll catch everybody. Absolutely. <clears throat> Okay. Yeah, no, I just had um, sort of an overall comment, which is just that I just love hearing these updates and all the things that are happening. And what I, one thing I just really appreciate is um, all of the time and work and thought that goes into um, just the whole child kind of aspect and the transitions and the making sure that they feel, you know, looked out for looking at all the extracurriculars and all of that and just, um, it's just so much more than academics, and mm -hmm. it shows, and it's just wonderful to see. So thank you for all of it. Thank you. Ditto, ditto, ditto. All right. Great. Thank you. Thank you. And just, uh, I guess I'm just going to add on to that comment. Uh, you know, and, uh, my kids were in school a long time ago, uh, and I think about. Uh, all the effort, uh, importance of social and emotional well-being of kids today, with what they um, with what they go through, um, and uh, I kind of marvel at you know what's had to happen, you know, in uh, in the in the um, efforts, you know, of the faculty, you know. And the strategy, if you will, and, uh, execution. So it's uh, you're all to be really commended uh, for what you do. Um, COVID nineteen update. Sure. So actually, I'll I'll do a brief introduction. Um, so we have. Well, I'm uh, sorry. Oh, I'm so sorry. Yes. I'm, I'm incorrect. But that was very intuitive. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, Jennifer is not here this evening. Yes, yeah, so Jennifer, Dr. Lipton O'Connor, is wearing her parent hat, which is her most important hat this evening. And uh, so she, you, so you will be. So, or, or, so Mary, or Mary I just need be. you to close your eyes. Okay, <laughs> Imagine okay. that my hair is a little bit curlier. <laughs> but I think it's my enough. voice is a few octaves higher. Okay. I'm a few inches taller. <laughs> But I just want to acknowledge that, um, you know, uh, Dr. Lipton O'Connor, in her role as social emotional learning coordinator, works hand in hand with Mary Allen Duggan, who is our okay. wellness coordinator at least, uh, nurse leader. Um, so they are constantly together. So I have to separate them from meetings and then our meetings. Um, so on behalf of um, the work of the district, um, Mary Allen will present an update and answer any questions. And those questions we can't answer. We will make sure they get back to um, Dr. O'Connor um, and we'll get back to the committee. So, Mary Ellen. All right. So, you can close your eyes and pretend I'm Jennifer. <laughs> um, you can go to the next slide. We're going to just talk a little bit about the social emotional updates since she was here last. Um, all the schools have completed their screener, their social emotional screener, and they're in the process of analyzing that data now. Um, the educators are using the screen of data to inform with the class placement. As you know, that is a huge process and an undertaking that um, every year to put the students in the correct placement for classes and they are using the results of the um, social emotional screener to help them with that. Um, 
And the other data that's considered um, to inform our plans for next year, as Jennifer and I work together to um, create the healthy and balanced learners that we're hoping to create. Um, we look at student attendance, um, counseling referrals throughout the year, their students' grades and graduation rates, the uh, results of the equity audit, the Metro West Adolescent Health Survey results, um, the, the SBIRT, which is the substance use screener, um, the 504 and special education referrals, discipline referrals, student hospitalizations, and student and parent surveys that we've given up. So all of that data together helps us inform and make our plans for next year. So some work that we've been working on um, together, we got uh, grants from the Metro S Health Foundation. We just found out about um, last week that we received $108,000 oh, in grants. <laughs> um, so, and those grants will go towards the expansion of our family success partnership collaboration that we have. Um, and also, Dr. Lipton O'Connor applied for a Castle Academy Fellowship and was accepted into that. And the grant is covering the uh, cost of that. And then uh, um, membership with the Massachusetts Partnership for Youth, which is an organization that provides resources and professional development um, for our community. By just having that membership, we can we have access to more professional development and more resources. Um, some things that we've worked on recently uh, is the webinar series, the parent support webinar series. So when we got the um, key indicator results from our Metro West Adolescent Health Survey, there were some um, results that we felt like we needed to do something. It couldn't wait to plan for the summer to do something for the fall, which we, we certainly are doing now with the suicide prevention programs for our students. But that we needed to give parents some tools in their toolbox for the summer when there's some unscheduled time and some downtime. So that was the webinar series um, that we've done for the past two Tuesdays and then next Tuesday is our third one. The first one was on suicidality and um, having difficult conversations. The and, uh, um, Carrie, Carrie Tool and Dr. Medina presented on that. Last night was on cyber safety and um, social media and cyber bullying. And uh, Dr. Lipton O'Connor, Dr. Medina presented. And we also had um, Aaron Miller from the DA's office come in, DA Early's office, and do a pre be part of the presentation. And then our final one is kind of a wrap up, a little bit about resiliency, what we can do for ourselves to promote our mental health and well-being as we're going forward. We are looking into suicide prevention programs for the high school and middle school. It's um, the ones where we've been um, looking at is signs of suicide. And then some mental health first tra aid trainings, which some of our staff have done for professional development, but we continue to look at that in our collaboration with the Youth and Family Services and FSP to help us with those professional development trainings. Jennifer would like to thank all the teachers, staff, families, and administrators for supporting this work as she has finished up her first year in this role. So I can take questions about that, maybe. <laughs> we can collaboratively answer them. Not so sure as well as she could, but. I have a question. First, I have a comment. Um, I haven't gotten to, uh, to the <coughs> webinar from last night, but the first week, was fantastic and um, highly recommend that all parents watch it even if you don't think like suicide is sort of on your agenda because I think a lot of the strategies that um, Carrie gave to parents were just mm -hmm. like they were so concrete and like you know They'll help. They'll help all kinds of parenting issues. <laughs> really, oh, I honestly, think, I think all of us will have that do say and don't yes, say right, list exactly. hanging on our fridge because I use it with my thirty-something-year-old right. children. Right. <laughs> um, and my question is, I'm wondering if you can um, talk a little bit about that FSP program, like what it is. Sure. So, Family Success Partnership is um, we 
contract with Aspen Valley Collaborative which is the Family Success Partnership, which are licensed uh, mental health counselors and social workers who help do wraparound services for our families. So this, we've had this collaboration with them for years and year, probably at least 10 years, I want to say. Um, so when we have, in the school, when we've um, tried everything and then we've reached out to our community, the Youth and Family Services, tried everything and we, the FSP provides those wraparound services that we can't go into the home and help them with. So um, they have that, they have multilingual uh, counselors that can help fill that gap that we don't have when we need them. They are just amazing. Um, <laughs> and I don't know where we would be without them really um, to just help support our students. What they saw this year, the reason we wrote the grant is this year, um, they saw a lot more requests for along with the wraparound services for the one-on-one -on -one consultations with students to, to support the students. Um, and so that's where they spent a lot of time with that. So with this expansion of that, we hope to promote that, be able to fill in that gap for that one-on-one -on -one that might be needed. And how do they, is it really school, like school related? So like struggles with school, or is it like sort of like the whole situation? It's the whole, the whole, yeah. the whole family situation. It's wraparound services for the And family. it's referred by the school. So like Correct. if a family is working with somebody, okay. So they, there's a whole referral service that comes to me. Okay. I speak to them, it goes back to the team. With their okay, awesome, yes. that's great. Congratulations, that's a great great yeah. yeah, I just want to acknowledge Mary Ellen and uh, Jennifer for writing the grant taking the initiative, you know, we often talk about what can we do to support our families, especially coming out of, you know, two years of pa a pandemic. And uh, this proactive work that Mary Ellen and Jennifer are doing um, is exceptional and $108,000 grant is only going to help um, our work in, in this area. So congratulations. Thank you. I, I, I was just wondering, have, have we had this grant before, or it, it and if not, how did we fund this prior, prior to this? Or did we? Not so we have an FSP has been a part. This is just expanding that program and adding on. So they're going along with the one-on-one -on -one consult. They'll be in the schools, feel a little bit more present in the schools. They they might be assigned to the schools. They um, are going to do professional development for the staff, consultations for the staff. Um, you know, so those kinds of things. So it's just expanding that program that we already have. That's great. Congratulations. And that funds two years? Yes. Mm -hmm. And it is also important to note that it's across North Road, mm -hmm. yeah. Algonquin, and South Park. Mm -hmm. Do you, um, Mary Ellen or um, Jennifer, do you keep track of the usage? Yeah, somewhere like, and so you can hopefully see over time that you know, hey, we really got more families needing these services, or wow, great, we have less, so. So definitely, so there's a pre-referral yeah. that has to come through me, so I have everybody that's been referred from okay. the whole district, and then what happens after that, and we meet, gosh, I talk to FSP probably every week, but yeah. <laughs> we meet regularly with um, Marie and myself and Jennifer and the FSP liaison and talk yeah, about the cases yeah. mm -hmm. going forward. I had a suggestion, um, I guess, to Jennifer, I don't know. <laughs> but the web series that has already been done, if you could, throughout the summer, just kind of like push a, tr a reminder, a trigger out there to folks to say, hey, um, click here to watch mm -hmm. such and such, right? You didn't attend on the day we hosted it, but because, you know, here's three of them. And now maybe things are a little bit more relaxed. You know, you can, you're not running around all these different clubs, and so you could watch it and then the other thing is a lot um, and i'm speaking from experience a lot of us can't watch we'll find less time to watch something than to listen and especially for the programs that are going to like support um, the teenagers the, the lessons if you just take the video recording and load it to um audio um and you know i don't know what the legal realm, you know rules are but load it to audio then you, we can put it on our devices and listen to it while we walk 
while we're sitting, which is, especially when we're talking about emotional learners, maybe they're not so great at watching something, right? So we could listen to it while we're going on a walk to de-stress or something like that. That's a great idea. We'll talk to our tech team. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, just ask one of your teenagers at Algonquin. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> 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 oh, they have all that new podcast yeah. right? <laughs> <laughs> Get up. Um, yeah, so to piggyback on that, like a lot of the stuff that Carrie um, talked about and like her graphics, like those would be great, like make like little infographics that the district can share, like little bites of knowledge that you can like take but it in. I think what's exciting is that these you know, workshops will endure. The, yes. the, the yeah. information is going <laughs> yes. to be right. um, accessible in August and just as important in, in September or November. So we can push these out yeah. in periodic times because yeah. it's still relevant yes. timely information. Yeah. And this is the webinar series was just like really quickly we wanted to do something. So our plans for next year are to do something mm -hmm. more regularly on a regular basis, not just three in a row and then off of the summer. So I mean this advice right now is really hard to get access to. I mean to get professional um, it, to get an appointment with a the therapist, True. Mm -hmm. it's like impossible to happen. So, like, this is a really great resource um, yes. for everyone. And I think everybody needs to know that well, we do have lots of resources in the schools, and then um, through the summer, there's South Breeze and Public Services mm -hmm. that people can reach out to. Also, um, there are resources on the website after the webinars with with the webinars where they're posted. There are resources for each topic with lots of um, helpful places to look if you need assistance during the summer when the school's not in session. But um, hopefully this will just continue to grow and this is just the start. And I think prevention is where we need to focus because it is giving everybody the tools in their toolbox that they need. I have a question about the suicide prevention. I, I'm a suicide prevention researcher, so that's my interest um, what exactly what programs are you looking at or is it still early in the it's process? still really early we did look at signs of suicide um, and that's really the one that we've looked at so far we haven't looked at any because there's some and I'm happy to to help be involved in some of that and because I work with folks who do I don't I work with adults in suicide prevention but I work with folks who do adolescents but there's some really great training programs um, and assessment tools that like anyone can administer. So te they don't have to have a mental health background, but teachers mm -hmm. can administer them. Right now we're implementing it in barber shops actually in Rhode Island. So we're teaching like mm -hmm. uh, hair salon folks to how to assess and screen and then refer like what to do when someone says yes. But that same kind of program can be implemented very mm -hmm. easily in schools. So that's like the Q we talked about QPR training for Yeah, I mean there are different types of training. Yeah. QPR is one of them. It's that's a it's one of the shorter ones. They're the eight hour trainings too, yeah. which is probably not feasible, right? But you could in integrate it into professional development. Mm -hmm. um, so that'd be great. So that we'll definitely like, yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Mary Ellen, are you giving me a separate update? Yeah. Do you really think because <laughs> <laughs> this the, I, I'll wait till you go. So you're the, uh, the second one to do Yeah, two now, row, now right? I'll, I'll take on my own persona. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a doctor anymore. My hair straightened. <laughs> Spent hours straightening it. And, um, I, sh I shrunk up. something. Update, right. so, okay, so now we have our <coughs> new old business. Okay, there's still some more slides there. So. Oh, you're yes. still <laughs> I'm still on. So um, Never did I think I'd be sitting here every week with all of you, but here we are again um, with the COVID-19 update. But before I start with it, I really need to say thank you to a lot of people that have helped us through the past two years. Um, the nurses, especially, and the clinical resource nurses or float nurses, for persevering through the multitude of updates and changes that have taken place over the last two years. They've done an amazing job keeping the students and staff in their classrooms healthy and safe and ready to learn. I need to thank the medical advisor team for the numerous hours that they've given of their time and talent. The members of this value team each wear multiple hats, a community member, parent, and medical professional. And they have volunteered countless hours to guide us through the past two years of the pandemic. We look forward to continuing this collaboration as we look ahead beyond COVID. 
They are invested in our school community and I am indebted to them for all they have done. I would be remiss if I didn't voice my appreciation for the collaboration and working relationships that we were forged with various town departments throughout the past two years, the Board of Health, the DPW, the Fire, the Police, and the Town Administration. This was definitely the silver lining of the pandemic. And now we're on to the old new business of COVID. So since we last met, the case numbers in South Borough have drastically changed. Um, when we were here the last time, we had 83 cases. And now this week, as of today, we have eight. It looks like they all went to Northbrook. Could it? Yeah, exactly. So it's nice that they uh, both don't peak at the same time. Throughout the whole pandemic, the towns have taken turns, so it's been nice. That's one thing. It's been nice. Um, our attendance percentages, can you click to the next slide, um, have steadily risen from a low of 89.3 a month ago. South Borough is the yellow line. Um, to a high of 96.5 this week. So Finn actually holds the record, and it was done yesterday with an attendance rate of 98% the day. Um, I believe since we met last time we've only had one class that's had a little cluster of cases, more than three cases. Um, so we continue to make the recommendations which include masking, participation and testing programs and monitoring for symptoms. You can go to the next one. Kim, I know you asked for this data the last time. So um, we did have a few clusters of cases when we were here on May 11th. Um, and this was the principals were kind enough to collect this data for me. And these were the numbers of students that were masked um, on those day, days after um, that Wednesday when we met. So um, it varies from 1 out of 15 to 14 out of 15. Um, so we did have a oh, couple maybe it was last week or the week before, we had another uh, cluster of cases. And so the data from this case is before, prior to the notification, so there were six out of 18 students always wearing a mask. After the notification, um, <coughs> there were 11 students in the class for those three days, and it was nine out of 11, 10 out of 11, and seven out of 11 for the following days. So that's that is that information. Clear? You understand? Yeah. Yeah. So this is a this represents a cluster, the bottom one, like a cluster. That's it. Those ones at the top were when we met when we had those eighty nine cases in South yes. Borough. There were a lot of clusters of cases. Where right. Three so there was more a lot. So, that was, so those yes. are all separate classrooms. Oh, there, okay. Where there were three or more. So they've cases. all been notified too. All of the yes. top ones. Okay. Like they were probably notified prior to. Okay. To us. So the one out of fifteen was also a class that was notified. So it goes across, like the they, the 12th, all those classes, each one of those lines is a class. Yep. So on the 12th, well, that was, I don't know what day it was of their notification. Mm -hmm. It was just after you had asked for this data. So it was sometime after their notification. And then the 13th was the following day. Okay. So you can see, so when you see that, where are you looking at the one out of 15? Yeah. The day before, there were 11 students in class, and three of them were masked when it was checked. So that doesn't mean it was throughout the whole day. But right, right, just checked. at that one point. And then the yeah. next day, there were 15 students in class. So you can make the assumption that four of those students returned, and they were negative, so they could return to school. So I don't know what that's when it was done, but that was the data that was so, collected. For so the bottom row. is a separate, this, that's just a separate mm -hmm. grouping from last week or the week before. Separate group in which went from 18 to 11. Correct. Uh, okay. And of the ones that came, of right, those 11 right, that came, right, right. there was a um, large portion that mass. So I think um, the first um, section of the graph back in May, which is when we had the larger outbreak, right. right, I think it echoes what I heard Mary Ellen saying back then at our previous meeting, that it's sporadic. And what you see yeah. at one point in the day could be different at a different point in the day. But, um, and then, you know, thank you for presenting to us at the bottom something more recent, like in the last week or so, um, you know, that day one, two, three, you see that when, when you, once people know, well, in this particular class, in this particular instance, they 
Right. But is that really the last week or so? I don't think it was. So. I can't. I don't know exactly. What I can tell you know. the date. No, it was. It's just another. She said group. recent. It's just another recently. group. Recently. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. And I think. Um, okay. So this right here is our um, impact report that came from this from CIC, which is our testing source for the state. So oh, you can fine. see um, <laughs> <laughs> you can see the numbers there. Um, we have done forty nine thousand wow. um, some odd change <laughs> tests have been collected. Um, there, I put our positivity, our positive case chart next to theirs because I'm not really sure where they got their data from. I have asked them. Um, so, um, because if you're following the upper chart and the lower chart, one of our hardest weeks is one when we didn't put in any tests. So, um, they're working on that. They corrected the top numbers for me last night, and now they're working on the bottom numbers. But our actual numbers are on the right hand side. So, um, that's coming from the state because as of June 30th, our testing program um, through the state is not going to exist anymore. So the medical advisory team um, began discussions yesterday about looking to the future, what next year might look like. So regards to testing and what we will be looking at because we did, do not have any testing in our budget right now. But what it does show is that, um, thankfully, the accuracy of you and your team's measurement was happening, right? Because if we were only relying on the state tests, um, we might be thinking we were doing one way when reality shows something different. Yeah. So, um, now, even though we won't have budget to do the, the state-sponsored testing, um, has your, you and the nursing team talked about what you'll continue doing next year in terms of, we'll still have the tests in the office, you know, like if a student comes in and reports X, Y, and Z, will you still be taking uh, data to, you know, uh, uh, look at any trend, anything that's happening within the schools? It'll be light, maybe it'll be lighter in, in a sense of uh, the volume of data you're, Today, but so um, the testing program, as we know, which is uh, pool testing, mm -hmm. um, symptomatic testing in the health offices, and the at-home tests, um, which have been funded throughout the year by the state, is not going to exist. So we have we have tests um, still, the at-home test or self-tests. Mm -hmm. The at home test, we do still have some of those left over. I think this is the discussion that the medical advisor team's having. Like, what are we going to plan for? What's the best plan of action? Um, do we need to plan for a surge? I think that's what, if we had a crystal ball, yeah, yeah. it would be wonderful. I think that's what CIC is reaching out to. You know, there's environmental monitoring that's being piloted, um, wastewater and air in different places. So. There's a lot of. Is it in Metro West already in in our towns? No, not the, the CIC is just starting to pilot it. I did oh. fill out a survey yesterday saying that I would be willing to be a pilot. <laughs> <laughs> so I think they just have it in a few schools, and they'll have some report on that data within the next few weeks, hopefully. Mm -hmm. So it's a discussion that we're kind of having because we do need to plan for what will we do if there is a surge. What is our backup plan going to be? We do have, we will have um, self tests, um, but like the nurse is doing it, it's more than just a nurse doing a test. We have to get a CLIA waiver. We have to have standing orders. We have to have whole new consents because the consents that were filled out won't yeah. carry over because it's, it'll be a different program. So there's a lot of T's to be crossed and I's to be yeah. dotted. Um, so, but we do have the self tests that we can always hand to people to test. Mm -hmm. so. um, I have a question, Amy. Does your day positive test, is that just like, like just part of this program, not everything that you know <coughs> about? Th those are all of our positive the, tests. The tests, 
Right. Any positive that we've heard about anything that's on our track oh. sheet, not just the ones from the pool. Oh, that. I see. So, so if somebody reported like, a positive PCR, that's also or, or Or a positive antigen test. Okay. We track those okay. too. So, that's, so that's it. This those is are our numbers. numbers. Yeah. Those are the numbers that you yeah. find on the dashboard. Those, okay. That's there, yes. Those are our actual numbers each week. Reported ones we do, the ones that are reported to us. Okay. Sorry. Thank you. I think that's it us. for me. Oh, do we the new news of COVID. Do we anticipate that the, the state is going to have more guidelines as we get closer? No, I think the, the medical advisory team actually met yesterday afternoon and yeah. we, were, we, were, we were talking about, you know, again, what how can we be proactive around whether it's a surge or we have right. to have mitigation or there's a change? So I think we're still in discussion. No. I don't anticipate the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education providing any guidelines mm -hmm. or testing opportunities moving forward and things, unless things change dramatically. Yeah. Um, so the conversations, as Marielle indicated, are what do we need to be prepared for proactively? Um, thinking about what if scenarios and making sure that whatever we do, there's a positive value add to the work we're doing. Is there a concern that parents are probably also testing less frequently now, so our kids potentially going into school symptomatic more frequently than maybe people are testing regularly? <coughs> or a concern for next year that that will happen? Yes, I think there's the COVID fatigue to them. I think there's some fatigue there. I think that people just think, oh, it's bike allergies. You know, like even, you know, people that you wouldn't think would think that. So, you know, like it's bike be allergies. We, we have access to self-tests. I mean, people can order them. They're free ones. Your insurance pays for them. We have them at schools. So I think that we just really need to focus on staying home if you're sick and testing and doing some serial testing. Um, but it's a discussion to be had, and who knows, do you know what I mean? Like last year we didn't have a testing program when we, when, when we sat around this table in June mm -hmm. of last year, and then come September they had something for us. So I think it will be come from DPH, not DESE probably, or guidance, so. Yeah, I think also just the, like, the importance of putting together that medical advisory team that you guys are like talking all the time, I think it's just, <clears throat> like a great way, like a great way for the district to be set up so that they so we can be proactive, right? Like we don't have to start now. Like now that the guidance from, you know, the state is gone, we don't have to say, okay, what now? We already have that. We have to say what now, but we have people at the table already to discuss that. So kudos for that. Okay. Other questions? Um. Thank you. You're welcome. Legislative update is? So just quickly, the um, as I shared, I believe last month, the uh, federal government has not um, funded universal free meals, um, and that will expire at the end of this month. There is um, a new, new legislation that's moving through right now. The House has funded $110 million to fund a free meals for all, which would mean free meals for um, Massachusetts students for this upcoming school year. Um, we did submit a letter on behalf of the school committee a couple months ago, and my recommendation is to submit another letter just advocating for this program to move forward. Um, and Keith, in his presentation around food services, will speak to that a little bit more details. Okay, um, we have two donations to approve. Uh, we can do them at the same time, but let me identify them separately. There's uh, an excess in the funds raised uh, from an Eagle Scout project of $86.58. So to accept this, we do need to approve it. Um, also in your packet is a, a letter from Principal Valente and Lee Spignese. Am I pronouncing yeah. that correctly? Spignese. I'm sorry? Spignese. Spign Spignese? Spignese. okay. I was pronouncing it incorrectly. Anyway, um, and it describes uh, a donation from a Nancy Gould. Pronouncing that correctly? Yeah. Yes. yes. <laughs> um, 
of an Eastem half size cello valued at uh, $1,509. Uh, and this is going to Neary School. Um, so I will accept the motion to accept um, both of these donations, the $86.58 uh, representing excess funds raised from the Eagle Project and the Eastham half-size cello valued $1,509 from Nancy Gould to Neary School. So moved. Moved by Katura. Is there a second? Seconded by Kim. Is there any discussion on this? Hearing none, um, all approved? All of, all, 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 uh, <laughs> In favor. All in favor, thank you. <laughs> and that's unanimous. So we also have an appointment to make. Um, we discussed this at the last meeting. Um, the school committee has, a, you know, has a, a, the right to appoint an ex officio member to the Municipal Technology Committee. Uh, it's not a requirement, but it is our right. And. Uh, so I'm going to accept the motion to approve Ryan O'Leary, uh, Director of Information Technology for Southboro and Northboro Schools, correct? As, an ex as the ex officio member from Southboro Schools to the Southboro Municipal Technology Committee. So here are so moved. So moved. So moved by Kamali. Do I hear a second? Second. Seconded by Katura. Um, I can do this right now. Any discussion? All in favor? Carried unanimously. Um, we move to old business, and I think is Keith going to be up? Yes, we'll turn it over to Keith for our presentation on food services. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, as uh, as Greg mentioned, uh, the. Uh, free meals, which uh, we have certainly enjoyed in the district, is going. It was, was a federally funded program uh, that is going to expire on, on June 3rd. But before we kind of get into some of the details of that, and certainly the work that Becky and I have done uh, to prepare for what may be ahead, I did want to thank both Kyle Parson and Diane Kofer. They are food services managers, and they have endured a great deal of change, um, unexpectedness over the throughout the pandemic, often short staffed. Uh, and under supplied, not by our design or choice, uh, but they have had to deliver for our students on a daily basis. And, and very rare was the interruption something that they couldn't endure. So I certainly want to give them uh, a huge amount of kudos as well as the cafeteria managers uh, for staying in frequent contact with us and making the best decisions possible for the kids. Because our participation was up. Uh, greater than it ever has in the past. <laughs> the number of students that participated in the program this year um, you know, far exceeded any of our prior numbers and it certainly is due to um, one, one uh, variable was the fact that the meals were free. Uh, so that, like we said, it, it will expire at the end of June. Uh, this is actually quite a, a publicized topic. Uh, there was a, a Boston Globe editorial on, on the topic today that I was able to read this morning and I agree wholeheartedly. So certainly we have seen that increase, uh, increased participation which I've mentioned. We've really re re eliminated any stigmas for those that ones prior to COVID uh, qualified for a free or reduced meal. Even though we hit it as best we could, there were still things that may have been, you know, they still are on a list. And that's something that, um, you know, carried weight and we, want, we've, we eliminated that while, while having the universal free meals. And so it also um, allowed our team, because the reimbursement rate was, was great, and Becky and I will talk about that a little later, we didn't have to focus on that part of it and the collection of funds. We could focus on food preparation and menu preparation you know, for the students as best we can because there were certainly a lot of challenges to navigate. So if we get in deeper into those challenges, these are things that I have mentioned before, um, and certainly we've all experienced it in our personal lives. Uh, food shortages did not escape the meal program here at school. Uh, our federal commodities were unpredictable at times, and uh, we had to make adjustments accordingly. Delivery constraints, last minute changes to schedule. We were expecting a bread order at 6 a.m., but it didn't show up until 3 p.m. Things like that occurred with a level of frequency that was challenging for um, you know, Kyle and Diane to manage. 
And due to those you know, food shortages and constraints, we had to make menu adjustments. Thankfully, I think we really slowed down the preparation of menus. We were doing that monthly, and in some cases, six weeks in advance, and that just wasn't possible this year. So we went down to uh, about five months or so, we were doing uh, a new menu every two weeks so that we could stay, make sure the community was informed on what to predict. So that was something that we had to do. And fortunately, in the last couple of months, we've gone back to a monthly plan, which has stabilized pretty well in the communication to, to families. So I do want to thank the principals, though, and the cafeteria managers just for making sure that when it was needed, communication did get out, not only for students with allergies, but for students that didn't make, maybe didn't care for a particular menu item. We tried to get that as frequently as we could. And one of the weird things that happened is we had some items that were just unexpectedly substituted. It's kind of like if you've ever done Peapot or anything like that. And it's like, I didn't order that. We had those same experiences um, with, with our vendors. And you know, hopefully our, our, our real hope is that in the fall that's going to stabilize a little bit more and better as the food shortages do, do, do decrease. So we are anticipating and we have heard from vendors. Uh, that it will be better, and you know, it doesn't matter until it actually does occur. So uh, that's that. The other thing I would add to this that has made it complicated is we participate with the different uh, purchasing consortiums to get the lowest price possible, and the one that we work with to get us our produce um, didn't receive any bids. So they went out for bid to have companies, you know, provide for their communities that are part of the consortium, and they did not get receive any bids. So we still are going to be able to get produce. We just have to do it through some of our, our different vendors, which is just another obstacle that we're predicting for the, for the upcoming year. So that's something that uh, we were hoping for, crossing our fingers for, and we just got that update uh, yesterday. So it's fresh off could the you, Could you explain that a little bit more? Sure. <coughs> so one of the consortiums, do you have the name? What's the name? Tech. Tech. Yeah. Um, so the Tech Collaborative um, goes out to bid for a variety of different types of uh, products that we need. One of the avenues that they go out for is produce. So it'll, it'll have different markers like you know quantity, quality, shelf life, all those different attributes. Mm -hmm. And then companies will bid on those contracts. Okay. And if they engage in that contract, they have to deliver okay. on that contract and they're held accountable. Uh, so I think because of the volatility of that particular market, we didn't have any companies that were willing to put forth a bid, um, you know, for the consortium to consider. And this is one of the largest consortiums or collaboratives that does this type of bidding in the state. So for them not to get a bid, that speaks volumes about where we are right now in the market. So do you think it's a price? I think or it's, it's availability. They can't get Romaine. Can't yeah. <laughs> yep. Maybe. Right. Claims could grow. Yeah, and, and the Finn Garden might be yeah. providing yeah, for the district. Have tomatoes as well. <laughs> <laughs> Shelf life isn't. Being I heard you too, so. yeah. yeah, we're all set. We'll just expand all the gardens in the district. But certainly, you know, uh, you know, all joking aside, these types of things have been uh, continual over the years. Like we, I mean, over the past couple of years, where we have contracts with vendors, and they're supposed to. So, provide certain items and we'll get frequent updates that say it's just not available. So they'll give us like a you know one to two week advance notice that hey you know these particular items are no longer going to be available because of their 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 projections. So it's been part of the challenges that we've endured. So as we dig into the, the, the money side of things I do want to thank uh, Becky and her team and in particular Sunny Cox. Um, uh, she went back many years uh, to to look at our food services programs, how we did, what were the ups and downs, and, and we did do a very deep analysis of that. And we really focused on a, a couple of areas. Obviously, our, our income, because it is a self-sufficient program, was something that we looked closely at. We also looked at the trends of our, our food cost, our, our labor um, uh, cost, um, as well as things like food production, which was obviously a, a variable that uh, escalated dur during COVID. But what this chart shows is some of these norms that are definitely true. Uh, the orange line is wages. So you will see that labor is one of our highest expenses. And, and we're proud to say that we are able to compensate our cafeteria workers very well. And we've retained many of them over the years because of that. Um, the other thing you'll see is in the uh, gray and yellow line, the two 
um, marks and they're kind of like highlighted through a comment is where we did have meal price increases uh, both in 2013 as well as 2018 um, or 19, so 2018 2019 uh, school year so those were the times where we kind of caught up with these trends and now you can see from the very top right corner this is when we're kind of lagging behind and that's why we've spoken previously about the potential for a meal price increase so um, we did do from some of the conversations we've had from the three committees is looking at the local districts and seeing where we fall and this chart does a nice job thank you to Becky and your team for this research it also shows that you know our neighbors to the south uh, Hopkinton have already improved a 50 cent increase to their meal costs uh, for the upcoming school year so they're going from uh, 275 to 325 at their men elementary schools respectfully um, so we are currently a little higher than them at the three dollar mark um, but you will see a range there that is you know consistent with where we want to be so drum roll uh, not really. uh, so what we are proposing it is a uh, 25 cent increase uh, to each of the meals and the left of this uh, chart shows that we are at three dollars for the main meal 325 currently for the deli and salad bar and adult meal is 385 and then the increase of 25 cents to each of those categories is represented on the right at 325 350 and 410 um, a couple things I can comment on about what this does reflect is is making sure that we do account for the, the salaries of our of our staff very critical to do that the unpredictability of the market is certainly in play we try to really project different variables as to the best of our ability and then if we go back to a paid lunch program what are we going to see so you just ask that question and, and we can make some predictions but there definitely is some unpredictability to that um, maybe students are now used to getting a meal at school and they're not going to want to go back to a bag lunch there's a variety of different things and every family is going to have to make their make their individual choices but you know the data reflected here does not really represent the deep dive that we went into we did look into longitudinal data in a variety of different categories and, and this was the recommendation that we were coming to the committee with here in consideration so becky i don't know if there's anything you want to add about the numbers are great sure um we'll see if you you go first and then we'll see if we're on the same page no i would just add that the food services program is a self-funded self-sustaining yeah. self program that's it's outside of the operational budget um so again it needs to run in the black it needs to run um at a positive at the end of the year if not it, it's subsidized by the operational budget and over the past many years in south pro um, we've been running in the black and we want that to continue uh, moving forward yeah and i would say that we really have been i'd say kind of skirting though mm -hmm. like we're very close to like the break even or maybe we make like a slight profit in south Borough over the past few years but one thing to keep in mind is that right now for this year our federal reimbursement rate is four dollars and 56 cents for a meal um, which is obviously substantially higher so we have been able to given all of the variables that we've had, we've kind of been able to sustain some of um, the, the hits that we've had to take and maybe some of the higher costs that have been absorbed so that this is going to be helpful for us if this situation continues to have the increase because if we remain where we are, um, it could really be damaging to that revolving account. Um, question. Um, although we're the um, elementary level, um, in the graph that's on, I don't know the page it is, but the line graph, we talk about the high school. What, um, and then in the proposal, could you tell me a little bit about what, what the proposal is for the high school? Um, the reason why I ask is that line item about adult meal. Mm -hmm. um, in my mind, I feel like that portion of size, like, okay, that's the height. The older children are going to be like getting the adult meal, but um, maybe it's just the verbiage. Large, it may be a larger portion. You know, yeah. Correct, and, and and currently they are at a you know minimal increase number over the three dollars, mm -hmm. um, and we will be reviewing that with the regional committee next week. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so when we had this initial discussion a month ago or two months ago, <coughs> whatever it was, and 
I think I, I had in my mind that we were going to need to charge what we're getting reimbursed <laughs> by the federal. So I was a little nervous about what kind of increase we would have to do in order to stay in the black. Um, I mean, I think a 25 cent increase, if that's necessary to operate the program, and the last increase was um, four years ago. Um, to me, that seems completely reasonable, and if, if the price is still within the realm of, I mean, I, I you know, the way everything else is going up these days, that doesn't seem, it, it, to me that seems reasonable, and I appreciate all this inf background information about how it's all kind of trended over time, and, and you can just see how that happens. It's just it is what it is in a way. So thank you, that's a very good presentation. I, I feel that this is, seems reasonable to me, and I, I did the math, if I'm doing it right, it's like an 8% increase, Correct. so it's not, it's not a crazy percentage considering the last one was several years ago. Kim? So. <clears throat> um, the, this production, is it based on the same participation as this year or lower? Yeah, we actually did go back. Um, we looked pre-pandemic. Okay. Um, we would try to come up with a, a nice average so that we could make our projections based on that. And do we have a little, um, is there a balance in the revolving account that's like significant or? Um, there is a balance in the revolving account as of right now. Um, and so that will help to offset, you know, any oopsie. Yes. So I think it's important to note that we're, we're returning to normal mm -hmm. next year potentially. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that there are a lot of unknowns, um, participation, food costs and so forth. We do feel like a 25 cent increase in the, the balance we have currently in the revolving account for food services will allow us to kind of observe and watch mm -hmm. and then determine if, um, you know, we need to come back to the committee and yeah. say, you know, 25 cents wasn't right. enough. Yeah. Uh, we need a larger increase. Um, I have another question. I do actually think 25 cents is very reasonable and I, th I don't think that I really don't think there'll be much pushback either. Like it doesn't, I, I don't think it'll be particularly fine. Um, I'll agree. Um, but my question is, um, a few years ago, a group of parents sort of like, they were having conversations with, I think Kyle, I think it was Kyle, about like um, what the food was. And I think that the consortium was sort of like the hindrance mm. to that. Like we have to buy kind of what is offered through this buying group and we can't really go outside of that. So I'm wondering if one, it's an opportunity, maybe if we're not, if we have to go outside of that buying group to like look at other things. Um, and then also if the state approves it, assuming it'll be a higher reimbursement rate, also an opportunity to sort of like look at the overall, like, content. I, know, I, hate, I hate to say quality, but that's what I mean, you know, and I don't mean that there's no quality, but like the quality of the food and um, where it's sourced and that kind of thing. Um, so I guess it's more just a comment. Like, can we take that those, those opportunities. Well, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, I perceive, you know, I mean, we have a, th this has got to be such a difficult, difficult situation to, to balance because you're balancing the economics, uh, you know, with food quality. But I perceive that if you go outside the consortium, that would change the economics a bit. Am I incorrect in that? I mean, or, or not? I mean, not, not necessarily with just one thing, but sure. I mean, it, is that, that an unwarranted assumption on my part? I think that, Keith, feel free to add, I think that there's a lot of opportunity uh, to look at the nutritional value of the food we're providing students. I think the work that Mary Ellen is doing, and it's an opportunity to provide students with education around choices they're making. And I think there are opportunities to increase the quality of the food 
how we're preparing it. Um, so I think those are discussions we actually were having pre-pandemic. Right. I think um, through Mary Ellen working in partnership with Keith and Kyle Parson, really looking at you know what can we do differently? Can we scratch cook more? How can we use the food that we are getting to really thinking about you know what are we providing students? And students should have a voice and have input and feedback around. Yeah, that seems very important. What what they would like to see. I so, um, well, just I also um, think twenty five cents is, is, is very reasonable. I looked at the uh, looked at the chart where um, in our in, in this uh, presentation of a local district, there are ten other schools. Um, looking at the middle school, uh, there are only four other schools that uh, charge less than Southboro, and those are 25 cents less. And the rest of them all charge more than we do. So based on the fact that we don't see what is going to happen with those other schools, I would say that it's almost uh, impossible to believe that you're not going to see increases across the board. Mm -hmm. And even at the um, elementary level, there are still only four schools um, out of the 10 other schools that are that are less than South Carolina. And that's also only 25 cents less. So we're in the, you know, we're still in the low end, if you will, of uh, what we charge compared to our overall district uh, and, and will be, you know, I predict. Which also Wait. could present another opportunity, right? Like as we have like things settle down and like look more at that, like there might be room to like spend more. Spend I think the more. question too spend more or charge more. Both. I think the yeah. question too yeah. is what are what are the consumers willing to pay for yes. for higher mm -hmm. quality yes. product? So it's not always yeah. what's the lowest price, but you know if if we add another increase, what is the product that we're delivering to our, our students? So I think there's that conversation yes. which we've not had, right. mm -hmm. and I think we need time to kind of and recalibrate, settle in, and then get some data, and then have those conversations going forward. And there's a lot of research already about, you know, like, you know, the food has to be like something that the kids will eat, right? And like, how do we do that, like? You know how how can we be more efficient? Like I sat through a TED talk ish mm -hmm. um, where they made suggestions like as people retire, you replace them with a professional chef, and like the food tastes better sometimes, and like the um, they uh, the professional chefs like were able to use more of the food, so like they saved money that way. It, it was fascinating. So I think there's like lots of opportunity to sort of you know learn. <coughs> Will there be any change in the, I assume not, right, in the who ca who qualifies for a reduced lunch now that the increase? There has been discussion, so, you know, that, that threshold for that will be adjusted mm -hmm. dependent upon what Massachusetts decides to do with the universal free plan. So we have heard that, mm -hmm. but we haven't seen any projection. So typically by now, I already have the chart, which the principals know about, and the letters ready to send out to families for the start of the year for them to consider applying for free and reduced lunch. Those have not been prepared yet. So I think there is this general holding, you know, on to the fact that, you know, the advocacy and the lobbying will go to the point where, you know, we don't have to have this discussion, you know. Um, because right now our free and reduced lunch applications have, you know, reduced significantly. However, we have had, and Mary Ellen and I have had this discussion frequently, we do still do have families, though, applying for assistance through state programs in the Department of Transition Assistance, which we now used to get updates quarterly or even less or even twice a year. We are now doing that update monthly, so we make sure that we're supporting those families properly in the school district, and now it's actually more of a requirement <coughs> that we do that type of level of review. That's great. That is great. So as, as we've heard, as we know, um, uh, it's managed uh, through a revolving fund. We understand that. Does anybody have any specific questions on that? Or are we good? All right. Thank you very much. Welcome. Um, and we are now moving to the master plan. Can you take a vote on that? Vote. Yeah. 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 Yeah
need to vote. Oh, we do need to vote. You're correct. Um, so I would, uh, uh, if I if I misstate, uh, if I misstate this, uh, you can correct me. But I, get, I would uh, I would entertain a motion to increase the price of school lunches from three dollars to three dollars and twenty five cents. Lunch. Like, just, it's 25 cents across the board, right? Correct. For it's three different, for the three different categories. Do we need to vote yeah. on each yeah. category? No. I don't think so. Yeah. Think I can do just it. Just the 25 yeah, so I can quickly do, do the main meal, 325. Yeah. Do the three categories. Okay. So let's, let's, so this, I'd entertain the motion for the element. Well, we're, well, we're already dealing with, are we dealing with two categories? Um, yeah. 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 Each uh, all right, so we need to do it for each meal. All right, so for the main meal, I entertain a motion to increase the price from three dollars to three dollars and twenty-five cents. Is there a motion? Put them all together. We can one add add them all let's just and well, and just, lump them all together as one, one motion. One. Yeah. <laughs> and increase the deli salad meal from three dollars and twenty-five cents <laughs> by twenty-five cents to three dollars and fifty cents. And increase the adult meal from three dollars and eighty-five cents by twenty-five cents to four dollars and ten cents. And so make that motion. So moved. And and <laughs> and so make that motion. I want you to repeat the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, moved by Katura, seconded Second. by Kim. Any discussion? Yes. Oh. <laughs> um, I um, I just want to acknowledge that this is going to be challenging for people. Um, especially um, when you multiply that by day by three to four children or more if you have them mm -hmm. that's a lot and um, so you know there's alternative choices that parents and families will have to make in terms of like okay bringing your own etc cetera, etc cetera. but I think just like from a fiscal point of view I understand the logic that this hasn't moved in four to five years um, what we'll have to be cognizant of is that we kind of need to stay here for a while as well. Um, and um, if there's new changes in legislation and laws that say, yes, we do have free, uh, you know, there's some sort of supplement or stipend or the free lunches for all actually gets approved, then I think that it should be revisited and the opportunities that Kim, you raised about, okay, so now we have this, uh, governmental supplement, then how can we make the quality for the um, what we're paying, you know, better, more enticing, et cetera. So I just, um, I feel the burden. I'm going to have to make some choices um, because each day times three people um, for nine months, it's a lot. Um, and from the meals, they're only taking a portion of those items. So. Um, that's that's what I want to add to the discussion. I think those are good points. Mm -hmm. Other comments? It's forty five dollars. Yes. Per student. Per student for the year. For the year. Okay, we're ready to vote. Yeah. All in favor? All opposed. It's unanimous. Um, go to master plan update. Oh wait, Oops. pizza dippers. <laughs> Do we have an update on pizza dippers? <laughs> if we can get them. Okay. <laughs> it's on the next slide. And <laughs> lobster rolls and uh, baked Alaska and everything else. No, right. I'm joking. It, exactly. it's, it's the availability. Yeah. Um, so we've had the master plan uh, on the agenda and discussed it a couple of times throughout the year. Uh, I think this will be the last time we have it on the agenda. Um, Katura, would you like to say anything about this? Well, so we, um, there was a, uh, the school section was circulated prior to the meeting, and um, there was some feedback to it, which was put into a new document, which was then circulated. And so we have a sort of a final redlined draft section. Um, I want to thank people for their input. I also would like to thank um, Sam Stivers for drafting the original. Thank you. Um, yes, thank you so much. Um, 
the original version, and I think this is uh, reflective of um, some lots of thought and collaboration as far as sort of thinking more broadly about the schools and the way, um, you know, sort of area avenues of exploration that we can look at over, as the years go on and we sort of return to some normalcy, hopefully, and uh, have that sort of availability to do that as we move forward. So um, my understanding is that everybody has received this. I don't know if there are any comments or additional changes to it, but um, that's where we are. So just to, just to add uh, a minute or so, um, this is not something we vote on. Um, it's something that we all reviewed. Um, this, uh, this new master plan for Southport is really an update from a, of a plan that I'm, am I correct, it's 2008, yeah. is that right? Mm -hmm. um, um, initially, I was the liaison uh, from the school committee to that master plan committee, and I'm probably um, exaggerating a bit, but not much. In the last plan, schools had two or three sentences entirely to describe uh, the school's uh, part of the master plan. Um, and I'll, uh, Katura uh, acknowledged um, select board member Stivers as, uh, as really um, helping a lot in getting that changed. Also the district with its strategic plan uh, was also very involved in that. And um, so I think from where we came to what we have now is is more than just significant. Uh, so I'm just going to close by thanking Katura because when I was involved we had three <laughs> sentences and since Katura has actually uh, become the liaison at uh, it grew uh, uh, geometrically. Well, I, I will actually throw that back at Roger and say thank you for your initial work because um, I got a, a good, a good I well, and a good section of what's in there now came from you, you brainstorming with Sam and what you came up with in the early days, and um, and so thank you for, for your work on it too. I think it's, I think it's, I think it looks pretty good, and I think uh, we can be, we would be proud to have that, um, you know, represented as our as our part of the plan. Please. The master plan, what's the, um, the, the term that it does it have? I, I, it, it's more, so previously it was more of a 10 year plan okay. and now it's more of a ev evolving. Ongoing. Yes, and it will just be revisited. And there is a section, it's not on this, but there's an implementation section, which for every section of the plan, various committees are charged with making you know, sort yeah. of follow up. And um, for this, it just says school committee all the way yeah. down. So I think it's the kind of thing where as time goes on, you can pick a, an item and yeah. look at it and, you know. And I think really important because um, the strategic plan process is so good. It's just, we know exactly, like if something's gonna pop in, it'll pop in and move its way through. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, and, and should we? And you know what's in, you know what's interesting about a master about a master plan, if anyone is, if people have looked at them, things move at different rates. They, they, you know, okay. Things things don't all move forward at the same time. Okay. And so certain things get out of date or long ever. before, <laughs> or ever. Fair enough. <laughs> uh, long before other. But you can't keep updating the plan every year. Right. So right. it's it's you know, it's it's an effort. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I was just gonna say, should we give Katara a like? The run with it. She's going to run with it. Yeah, <laughs> like we're all done. With this. Yes. Yep. Like, yeah. Yeah. So, changes. so I will She's submit this. Running. So, yeah. I, you know, and, and this is also a good opportunity to um, just acknowledge the people on the master plan committee who put so much time into the town's master plan, which really will benefit us all as mm -hmm. residents of the town. Um, mm -hmm. So, I will submit this to them. It'll just be put in and. And if there's any changes, like you just do it for us. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Um, thank you. All right. um, before and after school care update, program update. Seems to avoid. Yeah. Yeah. Thumb up. Yeah. All right. So yes, I, I do have a, an update for the committee tonight about um, the extended day program, Southwark extended day program. Um, overall, we are very much on track. Carrie Packer, the program director, 
is closing out this year on a high note. In fact, the uh, current SEDP is holding an end of year celebration, um, which was supposed to be tomorrow. Co correct, Principal Ryan? That's right. But it was postponed to later in the month and will now coincide with a recreation department um, event. So I think that was a smart decision. Uh, a lot of things, unfortunately, had to be canceled uh, for, or postponed for tomorrow. So I congratulate Carrie and her work to be flexible with that. And also for the end of year stuff, you know, Carrie is not only trying to end things well uh, for the program in its current state, but she's also trying to be planful for, for what's ahead. Um, the key area of update that I want to provide you today is with the Human Resources Department. Huge uh, uh, amount of gratitude towards uh, Heather Richards and her team, as well as the finance team, for really looking at and making sure that the transition went as smooth as possible. As you can imagine, two separate organizations, two different ways of operating. We have different policies that we have to follow. There were things that we had to adjust and make sure it fit uh, well, and we've been able to do that. It took a little longer than expected. It wasn't simply moving from one column to another. There needed to be some, be some thoughtful adjustments. So the team really had to dig into that and do well, and in the course of that, it created a little bit of a delay and some frustration on some, so we did communicate that out. We've had conversation with the existing staff and making sure that they felt valued, and we were gonna get them on board as soon as we possibly can. So for those that are interested in continuing with the program that door is uh, officially open so we continue to go through a posting uh, series of posting uh, for the positions and we're working as quickly as we can uh, to, to fill them so that has been a very critical part of our work certainly in the last month or so in conjunction with that uh, the enrollment of the program um, it is is doing well um, it's kind of trickling in as people's plans adjust or become a you know, uh, available for the summer. Our summer program uh, is actually a little higher than it was last year. So we're at a current enrollment of 37 uh, for the upcoming summer, which will start, you know, right, right um, at, at the en end of June. And then looking forward to the fall, uh, Carrie was able to connect with all existing families to make sure that they secured their seats for the upcoming school year and our outreach through the support of the principals has been done to all the different schools to add new families into, into the program. And that is gonna be an ongoing rolling basis and I'll certainly be able to provide the committee with an update in September on where we fall. Um, so those, those, those are the major updates that I have um, and it is ongoing working daily. I think uh, Becky had a conversation with Carrie today about some of the you know, software that we use for the program and making sure that you know, that transition is going well. So we're on track. I think that's the overall message I want to make sure that you all were aware of and that as things adjust, we'll, we'll, we'll keep you posted. Um, yeah, any, any more new hires like, or shifting that, she, that Carrie has done in terms of supporting the whole program? Or just everyone that's already staffed as, will be disseminated. As many, as many people that would like to retain their position yeah. or apply for maybe a higher level mm -hmm. uh, are welcome to do so, mm -hmm. and we're going through that process uh, with, with Carrie. Okay. Uh, she is a member of all those hiring committees and working closely with HR to get those done. So anyone that is presently employed by SEDP, um, obviously uh, has a huge advantage <laughs> uh, for securing a position moving forward. Is there like a... Um I don't know, like a legal cutover, turnover date, like where they're like previous health care is now, you know, the district. They body. are district employees as of July 1, 2022. Okay. Correct. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Really just really new employees. <laughs> they're, they're, all just, they're all just new employees. Which, yeah. yeah. That's right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I have a quick question. Um, Two quick questions. Actually, I saw we on the personnel report. It talks about the you have two new site coordinators. Correct. Is that it, or do are you still needing to hire one? We need to hire one more. Okay, and um, for the families that are currently um, participating mm -hmm. and to keep big percentage. Yes. Do you know going uh, on? Like, yeah, I would say all? so. I mean, I would say. Um, for those that have their plans worked out for the fall, yes, yeah. right, yes, right. Okay. and who wanted who wanted to retain their seat or yes. add a sibling, yeah. all that is complete. Okay, perfect. With um, a high rate of, of turnover. Okay, and then so 
I know it's not time yet, but mm -hmm. we're not going to meet again until it's past time. <laughs> um, we're meeting next week. Put it no, on the table. No, so I'm just thinking about the integration with um, the extended day program and student support services and like the sort of how that will flow and if we have information on the kids that are already signed up like do we know how many have supported you know like are, I know those questions are going to get answered between now and when we meet again mm -hmm. in September but um, I guess my comment is just like that make like, sure it happens yeah make sure it happens because I think like that is like one of the super bonuses for this program coming um, in-house I, I agree and I think yeah. that that um, transfer of information will be a lot smoother and available yes. due to the fact that Carrie is now well will be yes. employee of the district yes. Yes. in about 20 days yes yes and so like just the flow of like how we find out that information you know like mm -hmm. do we have a checkbox on all the forms and you know sort of like not just like big picture sure. but like logistically are we down to down to the detail well since yeah you know but again, she not can't Netflix. really work for us yet. Yeah. Although right. the yes. plan is yes. to do that type of mm -hmm. uh, preparation, yeah. you know, as soon as the summer gets started. Yeah. I, and then Carrie and I have forecasted that as soon as we can kind of get settled in with the summer, the summer, we're going to be sitting down and I'll certainly be talking to Marie and her team okay. about a good transfer of information. Awesome. In, in that pro care system that we use, we do have the ability to kind of have um, categories for students. So like okay. an allergy or, you know, some sort of a, you know, an illness, we can classify that, but then we can also pick our own um, category. So if we wanted to put like a student who has a 504 accommodation or an IEP, we could, yeah, they have we like could classify. Okay. Mm -hmm. You know, like information that would be, would be helpful. Yep. Okay. Awesome, thanks. You're welcome. Good? Yeah. Uh, all right, we move to the superintendent's report. Should we let everybody go? And thank you. Uh, I think we should let Mr. Mucci go. Mr. Mucci, he's like, I'm gone. gone. Right. Yeah. <laughs> oh, does Ms. Valente get to go twice? Yes. <laughs> yes. No, it's the will of the committee. But I would support allowing principals to enjoy thank the you. Celtics game. Yeah, that's uh, right. So, yeah. 12 minutes. Who's <laughs> counting? <laughs> <laughs> thank you, everybody. Thank you. Have a good summer. Thank, thank you very so much. Have a good, good summer. Thank, thank you so much. Bye, Steve. <laughs> is, if you don't mind, I'm going to stay for Jeff. Oh, yes. Yeah. Thank you. It's very kind of you. I just wanted you to stand up and say Steve's portion will be able to take on that soon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you should work on uh, discussing a definition of a novelette. Yeah. Uh, just be careful. Well, someday <laughs> there, there might be a time where he's reading your report. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah this is true. <laughs> All right, so on to the superintendent's report. So in your packet um, is the enrollment report as of June 1st, 2022, and we continue to monitor enrollments closely. Typically, we have um, new enrollments, um, a good sense of who's, who's moving into the community. What we don't have at this time of year is usually who's leaving. Um, so the admin assistants are working closely with families, any withdrawals that are anticipated to make sure that it's communicated to us um, in time and there. And in particular, Clayton is monitoring the kindergarten enrollment very closely as you know we are close to the class size cap. Um, so um, we'll, we'll watch that and if we feel like we're getting to a place where we need to add another section of kindergarten, I'll work to Roger and, and talk about how to move forward in that process. Um, but here this evening, we also have um, Jennifer Henry, who is the early childhood coordinator for the district. Um, Jennifer does an amazing job with our preschool program and is an integral part of the school. And she's going to share a little bit about the program and also speak to our um, Southboro kindergarten students. So welcome, Jennifer. Um. <laughs> Uh, 
Um, so just to start off with a little bit of information um, about our preschool program, um, we really try to provide a rich learning environment for all of our students. Within preschool, we have a very wide range of learning profiles, learning abilities, um, including children with special needs, children without special needs, EL students, and we really work hard to meet the needs of all of those students. With that is one of our fundamental beliefs at preschool is that all students can really learn and develop given the right supports and frequently different individualized supports across the school day. Um, our preschool is comprised of inclusive classrooms um, that are really dedicated to ensuring that all children, regardless of their learning profiles or learning challenges, can learn and develop in the caring, supportive, developmentally appropriate um, environment. And our preschool has highly qualified staff, um, and we really utilize a multidisciplinary team approach at the preschool, um, as well as flexible learning models, which really allows us to individualize programming for students um, based on whatever they need to access the preschool curriculum across the school day. Um, so if you were to visit our classrooms in the preschool, um, what you would see is a very language rich curriculum. So we have a lot of visuals around the room, a lot of language is being used, visuals to correspond to that language, um, a very multi-sensory developmental approach um, to learning. So you, you don't or hopefully don't see a lot of sitting around and um, things like that, but they're up um, you know, doing movement activities, um, some video um, te technology usage, um, as well as very hands-on approach um, to learning. It was mentioned earlier in the meeting, but we really take a total child, whole child approach to learning and really seek to help children develop their skills across all developmental domains. Um, and we also have a very strong commitment to helping children develop their self-respect, positive peer relationships, emotional regulation skills, um, um, social emotional learning skills, and friendships based upon mutual respect. Um, so the, you would see all those things happening in the classroom. Um, with regards to our models, so we have six integrated preschool classrooms, and each of those classrooms is led by a teacher who's duly certified in early childhood pre-K to two. Um, as well as special needs, so either moderate um, or severe licensure. Um, we, in addition to those six integrated preschool classrooms, we also have a specialized instruction classroom for children who require a portion of their day to include one-to-one -one highly systematic individualized instruction, primarily based on the principles and procedures of applied behavioral analysis, and or some highly structured small group learning opportunities and students across the day participate in that individualized classroom and get their programming from that classroom based upon whatever their needs are. So some children might be in there for you know, a small portion of the day, others may be in there for longer just based on their learning needs and profiles um, and whatever their IEP team has determined. Um, we also have related service providers who deliver therapy, so there are um, a lot of different service providers and they deliver that therapy in or out of the classroom based upon individual student IEP teams and what those teams have determined is most meaningful for the child to make progress. Um, so with regards to schedules, we have a, a variety of different schedules at the preschool. Um, firstly, we have students who pay tuition to attend preschool. So those are students who are not recommended for preschool preschool classroom participation through the IEP process. Um, and we have five full day classrooms, four full day classrooms, and four half day, both morning and afternoon sessions um, that are available to families. Um, for special education students, so those are students who are recommended for a preschool classroom through the IEP process, we have 4.5 full day classrooms. Um, children who are recommended for 4.5 full day preschool classrooms typically are working on skills across multiple developmental domains and really require very specialized intensive um, instruction for a portion of their day. And then we have four half day classrooms, um, which again we have morning sessions and afternoon sessions. 
So a lot of different options in how to participate in preschool, um, as well as um, different schedules and what a schedule looks like for any child at the preschool is highly customized based on their needs. Um, so with regards to enrollment numbers, so these are our current enrollment numbers for the 22-23 school year. Um, tuition, with regards to tuition paying students, there are 43. Um, for special education students, there are currently 10. Um, although I will say we still are in the process of evaluating and holding meetings, so that changes across the year quite frequently, week, week to week. Um, so the total students would be 53 per So I don't know if anyone has any questions. I have one on the 4.5. Hold it. Yep, the special no. needs. <laughs> what is that? So that means that Monday through Thursday, they're there for a full day, 8.30 okay. to 2.30. Friday is a half okay. a day. Right. Depends on the classroom assignments. They're staggered, and that is allows us time for a consultation for all service providers to meet and talk about individual students and have team meetings. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, this was really good. Thank you. Um, and one question that I have is around um, playtime. Um, so we talked about the breakdown in the classroom. Could you describe what their outside time is like um, in terms of togetherness? Um, if we, you know, is there um, opportunity that this will be separated by the classes, or is it that tw half, you know, two classes are outside at the same time, and yeah, yeah. three so classes, or the, all of them, all 53, I don't know. So it's, a <laughs> <laughs> it's a combination of a, a little bit of everything. So there are times that the entire preschool might be outside. That's not an everyday occurrence. Mm -hmm. um, primarily, we have a schedule um, that's based on a lot of different variables. And so generally speaking, two or three preschool classrooms might be out at the same time. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Uh, yeah. Um, that was great, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, and I have a couple of um, questions. The 53, is that, how many slots are, like if you're fully booked? Like is 53 kind of like what you would expect at this time or is it low or high or? I would say it's about what we typically would expect yeah. to start with. We know going into a school year that we will be adding students as they turn three, if their teams find them eligible. Um, but with that being said, we still have room for growth. Yeah. Um, we've made some changes about how we assign children to different classrooms to allow us more flexibility oh. um, because the numbers are very low. So. Okay. Um, but we still have plenty of room. Yeah, 10 totally seems low to me, but that's probably not gonna last for very long. The ten. It could change by the end You're of right. the week. Right. <laughs> <laughs> tomorrow. Um, and I also wanted to point out, correct me if I'm wrong, but the fact that um, all classrooms have dual certified yeah. teachers is 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 kind of not necessarily normal, right? Like it's do all do preschools. I I've heard that that is like um, like a great attribute of our program. It's a big deal. Yeah. It is not a legal mandate that they all have to be yeah. certified teachers. There are districts where that is the preference, but it is very yeah. important to our district. Okay. Um, so just wanted to point that out. And um, do we have any students that spend 100% of their time in that? Um, Individualized. Individual, is that what it's called? What's it called again? The individualized Individualized classroom? instruction. Instruction classroom. classroom. Um, we do not currently have any okay. students that spend 100% of their time there. Um, it is very important to us, research supports, and it's a very important to our district to have inclusion, and we know that that helps students no matter what the learning profile is. So we try, try not to. to have some meaningful inclusion for all of our students. Um, but you know, that's based on the team process. Okay, awesome, thank you. Okay. 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 I just wanted to comment about the, um, 
school fair that was held for the yes. incoming preschoolers. Um, I thought that was a really great idea. Um, so kudos to yes. you for that. It was great. Um, and just seeing all of the participants. Um, so if this is just year one, it's only going to be, you know, um, continue and get better. Um, so I just want to tell you that that was a great um, opportunity. I mean, I met, I feel like I'm a seasoned uh, resident, but just to meet new residents yes. that, like, so you're new to town, you have your small children, and maybe for someone like me to kind of just approach them and say, oh, hi. And um, this has been my experience with the school system, right? And um, then encourage them that this is, this is typical, right? To see that the children were playing and all the, the, the staff that was there supportive. It wasn't um, atypical. So I did have that opportunity, and um, I'm looking forward to more things like that. So it was, it was great. Um, the weather, you know, you ordered great weather that day, so thank you for that. <laughs> a little sketchy early. <laughs> no, thank you. That, that has actually been a desire of mine for three years. It was yeah. planned, and then COVID happened, so clearly we didn't have one. Um, but the goal of that, for people who don't know, really was to share information with the community um, about community resources yeah. resources that exist for a family. So we had 14 community providers that came to share information. They set up little tables and you know shared their information. Those resources were were resources that children with disabilities might be seeking out, as well as resources that you know children without disabilities would want. It was great. We had high school volunteers from Algonquin that came down and manned our children activities. So face painting, the art club came and did face painting, um, and they were a little, they were cutting it a little close to the start time. And then they said, "We're looking for the art club." I'm like, "Well, this is the early childhood fair." And they said, "No, no, we we mean the art club. We're here to volunteer." I said, "Oh, great, because we need people to face paint, <laughs> and I can't face paint, so." Um, but it was great, and I had several families say, you know, how helpful it was. Some, some of the resources we had, they were unaware existed. So. It's great. It's great. Yeah, great. Good yeah. job. From this first event, I, th I know that, um, so I, I have one, that's one of my children that will be entering the preschool age group. But what I saw is that, you know, um, each, pers each parent that attended is going to tell another parent. So mm -hmm. next year you'll, you know, or, or three. So next year you're gonna see more participation. But what we were, um, I think collectively as parents doing, the ones that are entering, we were also saying, this is your new school. Like it was also an introductory moment and um, to help kind of lessen any apprehension. Um, they may think that it's gonna be fun like that with hula hoops every day. <laughs> um, um, so that, that was- um, a different sort of fun. Yeah, a different sort of fun. So. So it's it's a multi-purposes. So it's great. Thank you. The only thing I would like to add is, you, Jennifer, you also had some preschool teachers who volunteered their time and were, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. were at at the fair. So just want to acknowledge yep. their time and effort in being at the event. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. I think it's into your report. Okay. Yes. And and feel free to stay for the rest of my report. Right. Oh, okay. <laughs> I was hoping you'd say that. Um, actually, I'm going to yeah, turn it over to um, Rebecca Pellegrino, who will provide the FY22 monthly general fund expenditure report, the grants update, and the facilities rental revolving fund account um, report. And I can't believe Clayton does not want to stay for this. So. <laughs> So we are now in the final month of fiscal year 2022. Um, I can't believe it. Um, so we're counting down the days now. Um, the monthly general fund report that is in your packet is dated May 31st, 2022. And it does show a balance of $127,505 or 0.59% remaining. At the same time last year, we had $386,978, or 1.82% remaining. The finance team is working with all of the schools and the departments to close out any open purchase orders and to finalize any purchases that are being made um, in FY22. And Pam Height, our self-borough financial coordinator, um, has actually just completed 
um, one of the biggest, if not the biggest, payroll of the fiscal year. So um, I appreciate all her efforts in that as we wind things down. And we are in a strong position to close out the fiscal year. We've also started to um, begin our work on fiscal year 23, where we have opened it up now for schools and departments to um, start to enter in their purchase orders as we start to plan for school opening in, in August or September. Um, so at this point in time, I don't have any concerns with the monthly general fund report. So why don't we uh, take a vote on this before you go to the other two items? For the main. So I'll entertain a motion uh, to approve the Southboro Public School District fiscal year 2022 budget monthly general fund expenditure report as of May 31st, 2022 until audited. Motion. So moved. Moved by Katura, seconded by? Second. Kamali, any discussion on this? All right, all in favor? Opposed, it's unanimous. Back to? Ms. Pellegrino. Um, so in terms of the, the grant expenditures, um, we have the SR2 and the SR3 that we have been reporting on. Um, you can go ahead and look at the. So um, for the SR2, um, as you can see, we did complete the professional development, um, and that is the $8,000 professional development line, and that actually involves the work that Mr. Harshak was talking about earlier, and that is the world of difference professional development that did occur here at Tri-Year. Um, we also, if you want to move to the next slide, um, it, previously I had reported that we had purchased some EL curriculum for the elementary schools. Um, and I'm also pleased to announce that we have now um, moved forward with the curriculum for the middle school as well. Um, so those funds have been encumbered as we order um, those materials for Trotier. In terms of ESSER 3, we really have not had any movement on ESSER 3 over the past since our play last reported last month. Um, but you can see as of the $281,464 remaining, we have expended um, just over $21,000 of those funds. And with the ESSER 2, we have until 9.30 of 2023 to expend, and ESSER 3 is 9.30, 2024. So we still have two years remaining on the ESSER 3 grants. Um, for the facility rental revolving account, uh, as you can see, we did start the beginning of the fiscal year with a balance of $377,532. Um, our revenues for this year came from three main sources, and that is Aspet Valley Collaborative. They do rent space at Woodward and also here at Trottier. Also the central office rent, that is um, the regional portion and also North Coast portion of the rental of the space at Neary. And then also the SEDP rent. So as of May 31st, we had collected just over $82,000 in rental receipts. Our expenses for the year, the bulk of it was really the work that we did here at Trottier when we had the electric panel issue um, last fall. We've also done some repairs for radiators and heating um, at, in a Trottier. And then finally, we did replace <coughs> the hot water heater. I think that was a February vacation that we did that um, at Neary. So our expenses were just over 89,000, leaving us with a fund balance as of May 31st of $371,054. So I have, ready for questions? Mm -hmm. Okay, my first question, not in, not in order of priority, is the SEDP rental, the rent line says $33,000. Uh, my, I thought that was about eighty thousand dollars annually. So is that because the, the, the what, what's the discrepancy sure. to date? I guess. So what we um, talked about with the town was when we decided to take SEDP under um, the district's um, control, if you will. Um, we actually established a new account for the extended day program. And we knew that we were going to need some funds to get that initially started. We've been paying for our carry. We've had some other expenditures. So we did start to deposit the rent checks into that account so that we could start to seed the program as it was beginning because we knew we were not going to be receiving revenues 
until after July 1st. So the 80,000 was or will be paid. Mm -hmm. And the 33,000 is what came in before um, you before. made that change. Exactly. Yes. Fair and that was done in consultation with both the town treasurer and sure. the town accountant. Fair enough. You know, and I will also point out that we um, are planning uh, in July to begin a paving project at Finn, um, and that is approximately $143,000, so those funds will come out of this revolving account as well. Uh, Couture. Yeah, so I was just going to ask about that, actually. So do we have two paving projects? Are we doing just Finn, and then next is Trottier? Or? So we had... To be determined. I think okay. originally we had, to remember the we had plan. two phases. Yeah, so we had two yeah. phases. We had the front parking lot and then yeah. the back parking lot. Oh, in the back. That's so what we okay. did was we combined the two into a single project. Got it. Okay. Yeah, because I was going to say this seems pretty, I, we're going to be running that down a little because it's not going to be replenished as much, right? We just, because of the projects, but it's good we have it. So we have also, um, Greg and I have had conversations with Assabet Valley um, Collaborative because they are currently paying $4,000 for each of their two locations. So we've had conversations where we will be um, increasing the amount that we have not seen an increase in that rent. I, I don't know, for as long as they've been, I think, in the district. So um, mm -hmm. it, it's better reflective of what like the North Borough and Region pay for the central office where we have a calculation and they'll be paying that same amount. So I thought I understood, but now I'm not sure I did, <laughs> about the, the, um, the SEDP rent. So if I looked at a chart of accounts now, where is the other half or thereabouts? Where's the other portion of this yeah. sit? So because, because this is the part, this is the first part that came in before. Yes, okay. So. Where, would I, where do I so find that? So we have started um, a revolving account that is specifically for a new revolving the, account. Yes. yes. Understood. So can we get? Can we add that to the monthly sure. report? Yeah. Um, and when we meet again in September, can we get a get sort of like the activity like in that since since the switchover? Mm -hmm. Right. So then you see everything. It's just a line, just a line item we are asking for, or like a new. So it'll page. be like this facility, right? It'll be like the extended yeah, day. They're actually, it's going to be far more complex. Yeah. <laughs> okay. It will so. be similar. Sorry. Okay. It, it will be similar. We we're going to be setting up like a budget report for them, so oh, they'll be different expenses. Be different. Like, okay. um, they'll be Not salaries simple, that right? will be involved, so it will be a little bit more. We complex. can give you, a, I think, a sure. high level mm -hmm. review. Yeah. Well, uh, I just get it. I mean, this is a. This is the facility rental revolving account, and this is kind of what we're starting with. No. No, no, this is what we're starting with, the facility rental revolving That's account. That's what we did. Well, it's going to, in other words, getting balance as of last year, and then this is kind of where we, where we are before we close out this year. Okay. But that's going to be a separate revolving account. I think account. The, the three revolving accounts that we will have, we'll have the facility rental revolving fund, which is your, what you're seeing here. We have the cafeteria revolving mm -hmm. account, which we, again, operate the food services. And then we'll have the before and after school extended day revolving account. Those are the three revolving accounts that um, we can report out. Um, but I just will share that the food services and the before and after school uh, revolving accounts include many line items mm -hmm. because it's a complex budget. Um, so we can we can Collapse report out it, yeah. report out big picture and um, like yeah the facility rent rental won't be too complex. This is Correct. this is yeah. as simple as it gets. Right. Yeah, yes. yeah. And you, did you want but to speak? I think that's fine. No, it is fine. Yeah, more com complexity. Yeah. 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 So, um, did you want to speak to the uh, Asset Valley collective? Yeah. So I think that we are anticipating um, collecting. Basically, what we did was with Keith and Becky. We did a facility uh, rental analysis of what we're uh, charging for a rental of uh, per square footage. And we went through and we made sure there was parity by all the spaces that were renting and all the organizations. And as a result, there was a, um, a 
adjustment to the Asset Valley collaborative uh, rental fee for the space that they're using at Woodward and Trotium. So we will be seeing an increase in our rent. Um, I think we said it's about $20,000, so I think it's $12,000 increase. For the year. It goes, for the to year. it goes to 20. Correct. That they can do that or? Yes, yeah, so the board yeah. voted oh, okay. to approve that increase. It's going from 8 to 20. <laughs> Other questions? Yeah, I have a question. Um, so, like food services, does that have like a, um, a charge for, for rental, for like the space that they use? No. Okay. Right. <laughs> um, yeah, that 25% right. in 10 right. Yeah, I know, right. Would, would right. I just didn't know. Get us very far. Yeah. No, it does not. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Right. Still, still with you, I think. Yes, yeah, so the last update on the superintendent's report is um, Mary Building Committee update. So we have Denise Eddy, who is a, um, has been appointed as a new member. Um, she has a wealth of experience, she's an attorney. Um, but more importantly, she served 15 years on the Ashland School Committee, five years as the chair, and she has served on the Town of Ashland's uh, Building Project Committees, um, a various number of committees. So she brings a wealth of practical and pragmatic experience as a school committee member, as a, as a board member of the Building Committee. You know, it's a select board appointment, but I think it has particular interest to us. Yeah. Okay, uh, I think it's a great appointment. Great. Um, all right, thank and you. That concludes my report. Thank you. Educational policy, none at this time. Uh, policy development and distribution, none at this time. Uh, personnel items, I know they're in the packet. Uh, yeah, I'll just note quickly one. that, um, you know, the Human Resources Department has a, done an excellent job as well as principals on um, getting ahead of the hiring of positions for the upcoming academic year. Um, so we, we've had great success and we are welcoming a number of mm -hmm. new hires to our organization and we're very excited. Can I, uh, can I ask, are any of those like diverse hires or have, you know, have we done any work in terms of trying to get them more? Yeah, so I think, um, some of the, the hires that we're looking at, um, like HIFA, uh, the L program, uh, we're still not seeing a dearth of diverse candidates apply, uh, but it's something we are trying to recruit and, and advocate for. Yeah, and I, and I can I can run a, I can have a report in the fall too around you know kind of the demographic of the hires. And I don't know if, uh, if from the e equity audit if they were able to give any like suggestions or recommendations on how to kind of expand or improve on, on those hiring practices to bring a more diverse candidate group. Yeah, I was thinking the 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 pool, like how like our efforts to increase the diversity of our pool, right? Um, the first step for, before the hire, I mean, yeah. Um, but uh, I think Heather at one point said that she needed software, like this change in software was gonna make it easier for her to sort of track that, like the pool. Um, yeah, I think, I think we, we could put it on as an agenda uh, yeah. item because there are a lot of strategies that we're yeah. employing to try mm -hmm. to create a different, diverse, yeah. a more diverse um, applicant pool. Um, we've joined a few organizations. We changed the way we advertise and how we are advertise. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of tangible things that we're, we're putting into place, um, and I think it would be great to report those those actions right. to the committee. Whether they result in right. a diverse workforce is yes, right. We're, we're still waiting to see the first it. right first steps. That is the personnel report. Um, communications. Yeah, so just a quick update. So I think the, the key update from the last time we met, we were evaluating Parent Square as the unified communication <coughs> for the district that would replace one call. Um, we have um, 
move forward with that purchase. So as of August 1st, our unified communication will be Parent Square. Um, we think it is much more um, user friendly and user centric. Um, and will allow us to um, really streamline our communication and give the customer, parents, families more options around how they receive communications. So we will be providing professional development, videos, information to parents as we kind of launch this the second end of the year. Are you opening it to like the district will use it? Will the teachers have so, access to it? So next to it? year this will okay. just be the unified communication. Just tool the district. So the, one call basically. From yeah. from the central central office okay. to principals okay. and support organizations. Okay. Like at Okay, and so like SOS, like but they would have access to it. Okay, uh, I don't know where I was that we saw oh, one of the groups um, that saw sort of like the beta of Parents Square, and it was excellent. I think it's going to be like a, I think it's going to be well received. Um, so I appreciate that. And that is the communication update. Um. The website, I, that's next. And yeah, so the website, uh, August 1st, we're on target for kind of rebranding our, our website, um, making it more user-friendly and more accessible. So um, Julie Doyle, um, working with Jennifer Tracy, is, in that, is undergoing that process, and we are on target for a August 1st launch. So I think uh, I think I sent out right the copy of the um, um, compliance from the state on the website to all of you. Yes. The OCR. Yes. Or the OCR. I'm sorry. The yeah, OCR. So 2014. <coughs> there was an OCR complaint around uh, website accessibility, so mm -hmm. that's been open for eight years. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, this past fall, we worked closely with the OCR's attorneys, and we were able to finalize. Of, okay. of, of the expectations That's of that group. So that is closed. Um, however, the accessibility work it, is never done. Yeah, mm -hmm. the, fact, the fact that it's closed doesn't mean exactly that. Right, and so, and I, on that, I think what, what Roger sent out had said, like, you know, this, they like accessed like the most active. To, do we have sort of a plan? Like, or, or is it part of the. The platform that it you know like that we don't have to sort of think about it or it's a combination it's part of the platform um, it's training educators around how to post and what to post it's you know we also have tools that we scan our websites every night for accessibility yeah. issues so it's okay. multifaceted yeah um, if the school committee wants to update their page which we talked about Roger um like the who like how would we do that uh, we can schedule time with jen tracy okay it's just tax so we had talked about like some of the um like what a school committee is mm -hmm. that would be a good idea to do before the new school year starts. right so for the like the like the launch that we should launch with it so i can work with uh jennifer and have Ask her what's the best one they receive yes, information. Yes, exactly. Right, right. And then I can share that with Roger. Yeah. Yeah. Roger's going to do that. So. Well, we have a, you know, there's a process of, you know, determining as a school committee what we're going to put on yes, this, right? right? And, and then right. that's, you know, that that's just, uh, you know, that's a, have to determine how to go about doing that, okay, okay, just right. to determine what it is. Uh, and then the process of, then the process of doing um, okay. Um, that's it on communication. Yes, yeah, and the last or piece is the on August fifteenth. Twenty August twenty fifth. Um, Chris Horan from Horan Communications will be working with the school committee on thinking about communications and branding and marketing. Um, so more information will be shared with the committee members as we get closer to the month of. August, but save the date. Is that expected yeah, to be like at 4 o'clock? It's um, starting at 6 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be in the evening. 
evening session. An evening, evening session. session. Okay. okay. They, may, they might Three even hours. have some comments on on the website, if you will, or the kind yeah. of messaging that you want. Is to it have. sort of more school committee like related, or is it sort of like this is what we're doing, like telling us what the district's doing? Uh, it's more around um, branding and marketing and kind of like best practices. Best practices. Or, okay. okay. A little bit of both. Okay. All right. We've got some minutes to approve. Um, I'm going to do the first two together. So there is, uh, I'm going to entertain a motion to approve the South Pro School Committee open meeting minutes of May 11th, 2022, and the South Pro School Committee special open meeting minutes, which was virtual, uh, on May 4th, 2022. Do I hear a motion to approve those? So moved. Moved by Kamali. Is there a second? Second. Uh, seconded by. Uh, Jen. <laughs> Jen? Yeah, <laughs> Jen. Okay, seconded by Jen. Any discussion? Yeah. Please. So I'm pretty sure May 4th was in person. Yes, yeah, so it was in person. town meeting. So why do we have... That was town meeting. Oh, you're right. That was the town, that was the... Okay, so... That was one, one thing, and then I had another one too. Oh, so... Okay, so consider that amended. It's okay. not virtual. And then on the May 11th. Uh, we are to May. Yeah. Is that the one you said? Yes. Yes. You say. Yeah. May no, 11th. That's the May first 11th. one. Yes. That's the yes. first one. Yes. Um, this is minor, but I'm pretty sure I nominated you for chair. <laughs> <laughs> and it says Kim did it. <laughs> All right, Katara. <laughs> Let's get, let's get that, we just should let's be get accurate. We're going to go in the hall and then we'll that's, decide. That's, that's, <laughs> that's, that's, that's major. That's not major. Anyway. I mean, uh, so, let's, let's that's my one change. change. That's yes, that's my one change. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, that's all. All right. So then that's also uh, amended. Mm -hmm. Anything else? All right. All in favor? Um, that's unanimous. Now, I have a question on this. We have. So there are two uh, subcommittee sets of minutes, right? We've got the uh, capital planning subcommittee. Well, let's talk about that first. Uh, we can separate these. And although you can vote if you weren't there, I don't think you can vote if you aren't a member. Correct. Okay, so we're... Um, so Katura, Jen, and myself will be voting on the capital, the South Park School Committee Capital Planning Subcommittee, which was a virtual meeting, I think, and I think that was a virtual mm -hmm. meeting, on October 4th. Um, do we usually do this in the subcommittee? We do the mm -hmm. end of the year process as we try oh. to wrap up all minutes. Okay, I see. And since okay. the subcommittees aren't meeting, it kind of yes. done at the, yes. the session. Uh, Jan or Katura, do you have any um, changes on those? All right, then uh, I would accept a motion from somebody to approve those. So moved. Moved by Katura. Second. Seconded by Jen. Discussion? All in favor? Three, zero. And then the last one is the Operational Budget Subcommittee of the South Coast School Committee uh, of January 3rd. You all remember that, uh, 2022. And those that were present, I think the only members of the subcommittee, correct? Mm -hmm. Were uh, Kamali Mealy and Jen Primick. Um, so you have these. Do you, um, do you have any uh, recommended changes? Kamali or Jen? No. All right, then I would accept the motion from one of you to approve them. Uh, Jen, so, so moved. I'll second. Moved by Kamali, seconded by Jen. All in favor? <laughs> Opposed? 2-0. Um, approval bills and payrolls agenda items for next month. Well, that would... Uh, I don't think we have any agenda we don't have items. Next month. I mean, if people have agenda, I'm sure people may have agenda items 
for the opening meeting, but you're welcome to email in the summer and any thoughts so you have. So are subcommittees stop, right? Like, so okay. Yeah. We did the major ones, but we didn't. I wouldn't put them in now. I mean. No, I mean, oh. Well, well, we'll, we'll talk about them next, well, of course, next yeah, week. The, the, yeah. the, well, the first, well, no, the first meeting, um, what we would, what we will do is, we'll, we'll, I think, have the subcommittees that are going to be meeting. Okay. Yeah. Uh, we'll put people on those, and then we'll take probably another month to actually have people look over the list, and. Uh, and then we're like into December basically before things start to meet. So we're into December we before what? Things start to meet. If we look at it and then make the decision like we assign in November, like then we're not meeting until December, like half the year is over. Well, I, so what just happened in the first two months, September and October? So, okay, what you said was. The first meeting, the first meeting, September, and then we, we'll, we'll, we, we'll, we'll talk about them. We'll make sure that we have. No, we're going to probably select people. Oh, okay. okay yes, to be on I mean. key yes. key committees. Yeah. And then we'll have a month or so to look at the list, and then in October we'll, we'll round them out. Okay. okay. Now, if there's a subcommittee meeting that we know is going to be meeting yeah. before the October meeting, mm -hmm. we'll make sure that those those folks are uh, are assigned, if you will, appointed. And I sense? Think, yes, and okay. I think I need to like know more about like some of the subcommittees mm -hmm. that like never meet. Like, is it us that should be sort of driving that, mm -hmm. or do we like I don't know who like so so like, that's like not that's a conversation that I just need to know logistically because I'm newish. Well, um, some subcommittees that never meet. Will still never meet. <laughs> name, Why? Na name Why? the names of. There's no business. And that's okay. a, that's a, that's, a, that's okay. another discussion. Right? But that's a discussion. Yes, um, right. Yeah. In other words, it, the reason that subcommittees don't meet isn't because nobody wanted to be on the subcommittee. It's because there really wasn't any practical business to conduct. Um, okay. And there's some that's then there's some key ones. Okay. Um, anything else before we do public comment? Um, this is not a um, an agenda item, but I think we discussed an action item, which is to make sure that we have a plan of how to talk with uh, the website development uh, person uh, to to provide input to it. So right. that's that can be well, done. Well, that's a, our page. Yeah. Well, that, that yeah, that maybe that's probably a conversation we have to figure out how to have. Correct. You know, without. Um, violating any open meeting laws, okay. Well, maybe do like but, the master plan. Well, that's also that's also why I mentioned that maybe the um, that the retreat, okay, might also also oh, add I some yes. also might add some we ideas. Do it. Yes. Okay. Right. Uh, right. And and are we in a are we in a uh, an open meeting at that retreat? We we that, not necessarily. We've done it both ways where we call we've uh, posted the meetings. Um, first year, the second year, we we didn't because it was just information. So. Yeah, this is this is I think still relatively informational, isn't it? I'm not sure that I. Is it think like a training? It's a training. Yeah, training. I'm sure. Yeah, it's Workshop. really a training. So I don't think we're gonna, we're not going to be voting on things. Right? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. I think we're. And that's right. good. that's a good point, Roger. Um, if we came with a draft to that meeting. No, no prohibition against emailing between any two members, you know, right. uh, throughout the next couple of months or any kind of communication. Okay, so, really good one. Um, um, uh, so I have a suggestion. Um, I found myself watching the entire Northborough um, school committee meeting, and they do something at the end that I think we should consider. Um, they report out on their subcommittees, mm -hmm. and I thought that was really. Um, kind of informative for the group. They report out on any subcommittee meetings that occurred between um, since the since their last meeting. Right. And and so my thought okay. was, other if we're not doing that, like how are we getting that information? So like, and this packs a good example, right? Like how is Katara and Jen 
getting the information from Kamali's participation, right? And like, that's just an mm -hmm. easy example, but. Well, that's actually a pretty good idea, I think. Yeah. All right. Um, yeah, something to think about. So I, I do think in the two years I've been involved, like we, we are doing that, but maybe not at the frequency of every single meeting. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Because I think some of the information comes out in and other areas out, right. of the agenda, right? right? Exactly. So like the capital so, planning, right. you have the, the capital plan, thing, right. the master exactly. plan, right. the operational if you're budget, talking but about not in, everything. If you're right. talking about NSPAC specifically, I would no, say that's no. a well, I would no. say that's a good one. Yeah. But it's also true. I was just thinking that uh, many other subcommittee mm -hmm. um, actions right. do get reported out. Yeah. You know, yeah. through, whether it's a policy. Right. You know, whether right. it's uh, capital planning, right. whether it's uh, so a lot of those just happen. Yeah. Uh, NSPAC is one I can think of, yeah. but I don't know that we report out. Uh, and there's some I'll interest uh, on a regular basis, and I think it's pretty interesting. But. Yeah, like I don't, I can't remember, but there was like a bunch of, like, they had a bunch of things to say about different aspects. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's it. That makes up it. <laughs> okay. Something to consider for our agendas next. Next year. There won't be much, there won't be many subcommittee reports It'll on the first the meeting, first but after right, that. the first meeting, yes. What else we got? Yes. Well, we well, well you know, <laughs> let's have public comment. Okay, hearing none. Uh, I guess I, I guess I will ask for a motion to adjourn, although I'm yes. not sure. Isn't there an executive session? Well, um, right now. there's. Was it on? For the for the, for this evening. So there is an executive session listed on there. Was it posted? It, it was posted. Yeah. Um, however, yeah. it's the will of the committee that we can also adjourn and not take the Wait, session. Wait. What does it have? Do yeah, we have a topic. We do. Yes. Yeah, uh, to discuss the deployment of security personnel or devices or strategies with respect thereto uh, and not to re reconvene an open session. Yeah, I misunderstood this. I thought that this was describing what we were going to be doing at some time, but um, we're ready to discuss that. Is that something we want to discuss? Is that something yeah. we want to discuss? Yes, yeah. yeah, I would like to do that. Yeah. I think that we will adjourn and then we will. Uh, so the motion is going to be to uh, adjourn the the open meeting and move into executive session for the purpose of discussing the deployment of security personnel or devices or strategies and strategies with respect thereto and we will not reconvene an open session. So that's the motion. Is there a uh, so moved? So moved by Kim. Is there a second? Second, second by Kim. Uh, all in favor? Roll call. Oh, yeah, that's right. And oh. we need to, yeah, the, the adjournment, but yes, right, so we need to do a roll call. Molly? Yes. Uh, Katura? Yes. Kim? Yes. Jen? Yes. I vote yes. That's unanimous. Thank you.